Hey everybody, this is Ron Albanese, and coming up on this week's Three Sides of the Coin, I'm going to tell you about my Kiss Meets the Phantom book. We're going to talk about revenge versus European animal eyes. We're going to talk about all that and much more. Hit play. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things Kiss. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Want to get your official Three Sides of the Coin logo and shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. Conversations with Phantoms, interviews about the 1978 TV movie, Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park. I'm talking to Calvin Richards. Was that my name? You, Chopper, and Slime, uh, of course, were uh, the lowriders. Right. Vicious thugs um, <laughs> out for a bad time in the park. Indeed. Written by Kiss fan Ron Albanese, it's just as fun as the movie starring Gene, Ace, Peter, and Paul. It's more than that, isn't it? Yes, Conversations with Phantoms also goes behind the scenes. Let, let me tell you the truth about the, the movie. How dirty is this? I came in and gave it the script and the deal was made and then we were off and running. They were trying to shock us. Gene and Paul were the real personalities. These four idiots clumping through our back lot on the high heel tune. <laughs> Pretty terrible. Severe headaches. We saved them thousands of dollars. Unreal. Disney would never do anything, you know, like that. Conversations with Phantoms also covers the aftermath of Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park. Were you happy when you saw the final product? I was happy that the thing got made. Particularly, I wasn't happy with the direction. And neither one of them were great writers. Kiss is a unit. Really? You don't separate them. But don't try to break up this unit. We did it to, to make them look good. Pretty mystical. The book includes 14 interviews, plus phantom findings, ruminations about the greatest television movie ever. Uh, you and your, your, your bad uh, partners there uh, kick down a wall of people, uh -huh. and, and you taunt them by screaming, And the walls come to me down. I liked when you fired Abner Devereaux. You said, you've been working too hard, Ab. You need to relax for a change. Travel. See the world. Get the fuck out of here. It's the book you've waited 40 years to read about Kiss's NBC TV movie produced by Hanna-Barbera. It actually over a period of time did well. I mean, everyone actually made out pretty well with that movie. I remember thinking, God, you know, it's so cool. I thought it was a nice piece. It was a hoot. Oh, yeah, it was fun. Conversations with Phantoms, exclusive interviews about the 1978 TV movie Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park, written by Ron Albanese, coming soon from Bear Manor Media. It's ironic, isn't it, Ron? I think it's a great idea. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. I'm one of your three co-hosts. Michael Brandvold, and as always, Mark Cicchini, and Ron. Stevie people, Nicks. Peep, peep, Stevie yeah. Nicks. <laughs> the California Tommy. <laughs> you're, you're, you're awfully colorful yeah. today, Ron. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm here in sunny Jersey, you know. <laughs> sunny Jersey. <laughs> um, so, you know what? We're going to make people very happy. Ed's not here because Ed is in Des Moines at a Kiss show, and um, hold on, let shirking me see his it. duties. And yeah, shirking his duties. Um, so he may join us at a later date, but or later time. But that means, of course, as if it's any surprise to anybody, there's no comments that are going to be read. Like he does it anyway. Like he does he never, it anyway. Never, I will. I will. Ready. I will just add. And Mark and I were chatting about this. Our new episode that just went live today, um, talking about the, the vintage kiss photos. Amazing response. Thank you, everybody. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really pleased to see there wasn't any negative talk towards Mark or the book. It was people were just very fascinated by the story behind this. Um, yeah. I, I just, 
you know, I'm hoping people learn something from it. It's all I care about, really. I, I agree. And, and you know what? Uh, like I said on the show, you know, Mark's one of us. He's just a, another geeky Kiss fan who wanted to express his passion for the band. And, boy, what a cautionary tale the, the man told. I mean, it, it's there for those who are wise enough to understand what he went through. And, and you know what? It's, it's like my old history teacher used to say, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. So take what he said. Again, if you want to put out a, I don't know, a poster or a KISS project or whatever, you, you got to go through the right channels, and the right channels are the band. You know, you, you have to get a, make sure that they're all kosher with everything or you could you could turn out to be like Mark. And that's a tough tale to go through, man. And and, and I, Michael, you touched on something so true. He's such a genuine, nice person. You know what I mean? He's he's as I like to call the genuine article. There is a nice guy. There is a hardworking, good guy and just got in over his head, man. And, yeah. you know, like he mentioned on the show, too. He's been hemming and hawing for a long time to tell his story. So I was really honored that he wanted to tell it on three sides. And I thought he did a dynamite job. And like you said, Michael, I haven't seen a ton of comments, but it, I did see some. And and everyone's reacting the way I hope they would. That Again, that he's a passionate KISS fan. And he did. He was trying to do something that we'd all, you know, want to want to purchase. And unfortunately, uh, you know, the law doesn't. <laughs> the law doesn't care if you're a nice guy, and um, it, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't care about it. passion, right? Passion. No, it, it doesn't. It, 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 pa passion means nothing when it's the letter of the law that has to be enforced. All, all kidding aside, what is what does the, the the justice do? Is blindfold? It's got weights. Well, yeah, you know, that, that's that's yeah. that's what yeah. that's what our yeah. entire you know law process in this country thank god is what that's what our law is supposed to be blind and it judges the evidence that's you know we, that's we it. we've all i'm sure all three of us but many of our listeners have probably been called to jury duty once or more than once and and if you think back one of the key things the judge will say to everybody who's a prospective juror is you are here to enforce the law, not what you think should be the law. You are yeah. here to enforce the law as I'm going to explain it to you. And then they will ask, can you do that? Because if you say no, then they'll just dismiss you. But that's what this is all about. It's, it's not about, well, boy, the guy is a passionate Kiss fan. Let's cut him a break. Well, you, you can't. That has nothing yeah. to do with it really does and and you know what i what i would add to all of this is be careful listening to the uneducated kiss masses out there who tell you oh terrible of gene and paul terrible of the band you're a passionate fan you weren't trying to make money off of this excuse me of course he was trying to make money off of this if you weren't trying to make money off of it you wouldn't try to sell it you just give it away for free. So that that's the first thing is just be, you know, Mark Mark said he got, felt like he got bad advice from his first lawyer. And and in this day and age of the internet, be careful taking advice from Joe Blow Kiss fan on some Facebook group because their ass isn't going to be on the line. It'll be your ass. Yeah, I think the Kiss thing is interesting because... Uh, when you have any band or any kind of product, of course, a logo, you know, is theirs and they own it and you can't use it. Uh, but Kiss has that second layer of owning the faces. And that becomes a whole other issue where I, I think it's kind of a unique situation. And a lot of people have their own ideas on, on where that lands as opposed to just a photog owning something. And if they don't use a the logo, they're in the. Froze up. Yeah. Uh, uh, you guys there? Yeah, yeah. I'm here. Okay, oh, yeah. good. It must um, be windy in Jersey. Windy yeah. in Jersey. <laughs> that was a big wave uh, over there. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> you know, You know. And, and one of the things, and I've probably said this before, because having worked for KISS's licensing company for years, who, right. who pays KISS a lot of money to have the rights to the logo and the makeup, and then has 
licensees pay a lot of money for the rights to use that on product. It's that licensed company's job to protect those trademarks on behalf of the band and on behalf of the other licensees. Because what, especially in the world when it comes to T-shirts, because T-shirts seem to be bootlegged all the time, yeah. some company will pay a lot of money for the rights to do official Kiss T-shirts. And then they walk into Walmart or Kmart or wherever and see a bootleg T-shirt on the rack right next to the one that they're selling because, and they paid a fortune for it. Yeah. They're, that licensee is going to get very angry that somebody's doing this and they didn't have to pay a dime for it. And now the licensee, the, the merchandising company, has to go after these bootleggers to shut them down because somebody else rightfully paid a lot of money and they want their rights protected. So, you know, at the end of the day, that's what this is for KISS and all bands. And whether it's, it's merchandise, books, videos, music, some company out there has paid for those rights. And they want to protect their investment. Other, otherwise, you know, if, if KISS turned a blind eye and let anybody make any product they wanted, they wouldn't have official licensees anymore. Well, what? that's what happened in the in the mid seventies. Uh, you know, a coin was smart enough to start going after these people. So, if you got a great example of that, um, just to go off a little bit off topic, but it's it's a it's a true story. You know, Bill of Coin gave like the guys who were making the mirrors and some of the belt buckles are like, hey, you're 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 making a quality product. Tell you what, why don't you pay us a little money here and then go in halves with us or go go into business with us instead of going through the court and suing them and all this stuff. That was smart. I mean, he, he saved himself a ton of frustration and got some cash for himself and the band that that's a smart. And, 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 and in essence, you know, from what Mark said and, and from what we learned from Nicholas, the same thing, that's what kiss did. Cause it's smart. Why bog yourself down in court when you just go tell you what, we like your product. We like your book. Why don't you go in halves with us? Okay, I'd rather have 10% of something than go bankrupt or have 0% of it. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't yeah. you? It just makes sense. Well, I, I in, in, I'll let Mike go into the, 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 the crux of today's discussion, but I'm sure you're paying attention to this uh, quite a bit. Uh, well, Ron. yeah, yeah. So, so, so this is kind of a nice segue because, Ron, last time you were on, I think you briefly made a mention about a book you're working on. Yeah, yeah, and, and let me just go into that by saying I did get my letter. I did get my letter uh, from the KISS organization when I had first started working on this, oh, about 2002. And I'll never forget, it had the big metallic KISS logo, yep. like the Creatures record in the middle of it, very strong. And it started out with something like, we heard you're writing a book, congratulations, but if you violate any of our copyrights, we will come after you to the fullest extent of the law. Good luck, KISS organization. <laughs> That's how it was. And I got to find that somewhere. But I held it. I was like, mommy, mom, 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 mom. I was like so nervous. The ultimate but KISS collectible has arrived. <laughs> <laughs> I am totally framing that. I got to find it. I have to find it. But yeah, you know, and I don't even know how that really happened because I had sent word through a couple of tenuous connections uh, to them that it was happening, you know, and this is the early days of the Internet. You know, there was no uh, McGee, you know, direct email at the time or something. And, you know, I or one that was out there at least. And um, I have a theory on how that actually happened. Should I say it? It's not yeah, bad. It's up to I mean, you, yeah. sure. I, at the time, one of the people I've interviewed for the book uh, may have let Gene know about the book. So I was amazed that all of a sudden in my mailbox shows up this letter. You know what I'm saying? So it's not like I called up Kiss and said, hey, do you want to work something out and do something? They kind of heard it through the grapevine. And you, you just know, and, 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 and I'll add to it, having, having worked with them, um, Gene especially... Yeah. He, nothing gets by this guy. In the world of KISS fandom, and and not just official stuff, I can't tell you how many times I got initially faxes, but then eventually emails yeah. from Gene going, 
What is and it would be like a printout of an eBay auction. Wow. Who's doing this? Shut them down or give me 12 copies or go out and get me 12 copies of this or so you know and 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 I know back then in the early 2000s um Gene was nuts about following kissasylum.com. And Kiss Asylum posted and, and for the most part, they still are. But back then, they were really posting everything. Yeah. Rumors, yeah. you know, facts, rumblings, you name it. Everything was on there. Because I actually remember one one discussion I had with Gene. He's like, I want Kiss Online to be more like Kiss Asylum. Wow. But in the wow. sense that he's like, I want not just facts on Kiss Online. I want the rumors posted as well. And we will refute the rumors when we post them. Well, Paul was like, no, we're not posting <laughs> rumors about us. It's all fact. But anyway, so, you know, e even back then, and maybe, you know, there might have been one mention that Kiss Asylum said, oh, hey, Ron's working on this book. Yeah. Boom. Gene reads it, prints it out, faxes it to his lawyer, says, look into this. And that's it. I mean, yeah. He, more than any artist I've ever worked with, he knows everything. He doesn't necessarily let on that he knows it all, but you just need to assume if you're going to do something, it's on his radar. He will know about it. Yeah. I've seen, um, speaking of, of artists that are really hip to that bootleg stuff, uh, I've seen Rick Nielsen of Cheap Trick actually um you know refuse to sign things you know on the spot he's like nope that's not an official cheap trick product i cannot endorse that by signing it i've seen him do it on the spot to people and uh it's it's really interesting to see you know and 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 at least for me i don't hold, i don't get angry at any artist to do that i mean it's, no it's no it, it's their business it's their career i would i would think any person would want to do the same thing if they were in their shoes. If you had a business, if you had a brand, if you had a product that you could protect, wouldn't you want to protect it? When you have a, a situation like KISS where you have literally thousands of licenses, you have to vigorously defend that all the time. Like you said it earlier, you can't just drop it for somebody because, oh, he's a, he's a good dude or whatever. You just can't do it. It's not how it works in business. Yeah, you know, and I, I remember hearing that, you know, part of it is they sort of have to reach out to everybody because if they don't and they just pick and choose who to reach out to, mm. um, that person could go into court and go, yeah, but, you know, they didn't go after these 12 other people who did the exact same thing. Why did they just come after me? And the judge is going to be like, yeah, why are you just targeting this one person? You kind of got to go after everybody or you go after nobody. Yeah. yeah. And 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 may, maybe the sending a letter is just their way of saying, "Okay, we've gone after and we've we've made our statement." Yeah. Now we just sit back and wait and see, does it actually happen? It's called yeah. setting precedent. It, yeah, yeah this, exactly. This is yes. How we, how we work. Yeah, so so let let's talk a little bit more about your book because that's what you want to kind of discuss here. Is you've got a lot more that you want to sort of reveal and and share with us about your book. I do, I do. Um, as a little recap, uh, this book was born in the early two thousands. I don't even know how it happened. One, I think, is because I finally got uh, the dubs of all the international versions, language wise. And we're we're talking about Kiss Meets the Phantom, by the way. Yeah. People. Actually, I thought we were talking about Dawn, Portrait of a Teenage Runaway. <laughs> yeah. Remember that? Eve Plum? No. Oh but yeah, we are talking about Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park. And I had gotten the dubs, and, and I, I just love watching the Italian one. I, I half understand Italian, or I watching all the dubs. And then one day, I'm going to write a book about Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park. And I have to do something that involves fun uh, in terms of Kiss. I get the kitsch side of Kiss, maybe more than some other fans uh, do. I would either write a book on, like, the Asylum costumes or, like, this. Or, you know, it has to be something where there's a fun element to it. Right. So it just uh, 
one day hit me to do this. And in the early 2000s, I went nuts and I, I started looking up people and interviewing them. Uh, this is the Michael Bell interview uh, from March of 2001. Okay, now we move on. And, and Michael and, Bell uh, is? Michael Bell uh, is a major voiceover actor. Uh, in the business uh, since the mid 70s and an actor as well and of course in the kiss movie he was the voice of peter the Catman. because you know for those who who aren't up on all of this minutia yeah peter's voice was pretty much overdubbed throughout the whole most of that movie it's not peter talking it's his lips moving but it's somebody else's voice coming out yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm being overdubbed right now. There's somebody <laughs> over there doing this. But yeah, it's really something, you know. And, and I guess I'm jumping ahead here, boys. But when you watch that, it's really well done. The, the voiceover work is really well done. It didn't and fool I, me as a 12-year-old kid. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wow, Peter's really a good actor, man. He's awesome, you know. <laughs> I remember totally being into the whole Peter thing. And, and again, more about that. I think because of Michael Bell, I think, and this is debatable, uh, that Peter emerges as the best actor out of the Kiss guys in the movie. No? No. I, I, will, I am fascinated for your book for one reason and one reason only. And I've said this on the show many times. Kiss Meets the Phantom was the first time that I went, ugh. Really? Oh, I did not like it. Put it this way, that's a little too strong. I didn't hate it, but I was expecting like I was expecting something good. And I remember <laughs> It was good. Right. No, it Wait wasn't. A minute. <laughs> not even by a long shot. And it wasn't I remember good. just It wasn't good, it was awesome. No. <laughs> as as a kid, you know, as a thirteen year old and at the you know, October of nineteen seventy eight, yeah. and KISS was everything to me. Boy, not not much has changed, eh? So, but I just remember going, uh, I, I don't, you know, because you're you're a kid. And I just remember going, I, I don't, I don't think I like this. This isn't, this isn't, this this is dumb, is what I thought. I I was expecting it to be, I don't know, whatever. Put it this way, whatever the opposite of what it is is what I was expecting. Well, was, let let, let me let me dig into that more. So, were you because. I recall, you know, even though, again, there's timelines, everything, as we say, there was no Internet back then. But I knew going into it that this was going to be Kiss meets Star Wars. It was going to be set in an amusement park. It was going to, you know, it wasn't going to be a a live concert movie on tour with Kiss type of thing. So is that what you were expecting was more of a, you know, I don't know, like, you know, the song remains I, the same I, I, type I, of thing. I, I, yeah, yeah. Although the song remains the same is pretty stupid, too. I mean, other than the concert part. Um, you know, I, I was expecting... Well, I'll give you... When I remember the first time, like, Gene did the lion roar or whatever that was. I'm like, that's dumb. And I, I remember <laughs> thinking Paul's voice was funny. You know what I mean? It just... And I was like... Ace really doesn't say much, and it's right. But the Peter thing just went right over my head. I just assumed it was P. I'm 13 now. I just, well, like, whatever. Uh, but, yeah, at, thir at 13, you had no idea they could even dub somebody else's correct, voice. Correct. Like, <laughs> it was a concept, right, right. It, it was funny, because I, I, that night, my parents had a wedding, or they went somewhere. They were gone. I, I just remember I had the whole house to myself, so I could turn the TV, because that's another thing. I thought they were going to be like, more concert scenes than what they were. And I remember I got some like Doritos and a bottle of pop. And I was I like my older sister was upstairs and I'm like, fuck, I got kiss all to myself for two hours. I'm going to crank the fucking TV because right at that age, that's when you start feeling rock and roll. You know, I'm like this is going to be great. And I guess that's it. You know, I think I just hit, hit it. I was expecting rock and roll and I got Saturday morning cartoons. Maybe it, it just okay. hit me today. In 2019, that's it. I was expecting to rock and roll all night, not Scooby Doo all day, and that's what it felt like. I, I, I do remember at the end, I was happy because they finally got to the. I was like, "Good Christ!" It's like watching a Godzilla <laughs> movie, waiting for the fucking monster. Yes, to yes. Like, we have to go through this fucking dial. Just get to the part where he's blowing shit up. And and I I I remember saying that. And I remember 
what a big deal it was like in school on Monday, the fo- you know, the following Monday, because I was, you know, I, I was that kid that wore my Kiss stuff everywhere. And I just remember, like, ha- having to admit to my friends that I didn't think it was all that great. I mean, some of them thought it was because the- they were all big Kiss fans, too. But that was the first time ever that I was let down by our costume crusaders. And it stuck with me to this day. I, I, I. I, I don't watch that. I, I just can't sit through it. It, it. To this day, it just, just I don't know, just, just not a fan of Kiss Meets the Family. Right, let, let's unpack that a little bit. Can we unpack that? A little <laughs> we bit? can. Um, we can. All right, so you say it was the first time ever that Kiss kind of didn't really yeah, live up now, to keep in mind, from t- timeline, like Mike said, time, I was there from pretty much the beginning. Right, Kiss was, right. I saw the evil Kiss, and then I saw the Kiss a little bit more you know starting to lean more kid friendly and sure. you, you, you were this, you were there for the raw kiss and you were there for super kiss yeah yeah but keep in mind this predates super kiss you know what i mean but were you okay with the comic book for example loved it loved it okay were you thought, okay with the with the color forms no got you there so i forget when the color forms officially came out but i'm saying you know this this they were definitely veering into this direction you know, and you being 13, I'm just wondering if you were starting to age out of the Kiss thing. Because they were like a very junior high thing as opposed to high school. Well, you know? I, that was junior. It was, eighth, it was in yeah. seventh grade for me. Yeah. Or, or, or is, is it, it's not so much. That's true. It kind of is aging out, but are you getting to a but point where. But I never where... did. Though. My Kiss fandom never, I never wavered. I, I went to the Dynasty tour. I proudly wore my Dynasty shirt. I didn't go through what some fans and matter of fact I, I like lisa said as soon as you know the makeup came off she kind of you know kind of took a back seat for a tour yeah. or two I, I never did you well, know i went straight through let, and, let, and, let me let me ask you mark so i mean obviously we we know you're big godzilla fan and 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 monster fan and stuff like that but as you're describing this it almost sounds like you reached an age where all of a sudden you realize Santa Claus wasn't real anymore. You realize that Gene wasn't really a demon anymore. Ace really wasn't a spaceman. Peter really wasn't a cat man. You know, the, the, the mystiques and the fantasies that previous years, that as a kid, it's easier to believe that, yeah, Gene's spitting up his real blood. That's his real blood coming out of his mouth. Who you told know? you it was pretend? There you go. <laughs> Uh, you but, know what but the, you, 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 you understand what I'm saying is that at, at some point you were like, wow, you know, Superman's not real. Well, how did you feel about I Was Made? Were you okay with that in summer 79? I, I was fine with it. I was fine with it because it was getting radio airplay. Um, right. Again, being from Detroit, that, you know, the, the, all the shit you hear is true. They did play them on the radio here. I mean, I, right, I did, right. you know, and, and WABX at the time was sponsoring the, the show and they were pumping the radio matter of fact i remember because cheap trick in new england yeah. and i remember them playing the new new yeah. england record a ton and i remember they were already really? playing. Wow. yeah they were playing a ton of cheap cheap trick and really playing a ton of kiss and i remember hearing like cold gin and strutter on the radio you know what i mean wow. especially leading up to the concert well you know it was a big deal it was at the silver dome well actually it was the mini dome but still you know forty-five thousand capacity it wasn't that was no small event you know so they were really pushing it and but, but you know we have to go back a little bit because that you know that concert wasn't until july of 79 we're talking uh, you know uh, october of 78 here in october of 78 was the first time that i it bummed me out i mean again it did it did like i didn't go into you know woes you know despair I mean, but i just <laughs> it was the first time that I felt that they weren't doing something really cool. And, and, and you know, when, like, the dolls and crap came out, like you're talking about the color forms, my younger brother, who's five years younger than me, that was aimed straight at him. And I, he was a KISS fan because I was a KISS fan and my older brother was a KISS fan. You know what I mean? So KISS was a big deal in our house. You know, I obviously stayed with it to the nth degree, but, you know, um, my younger brother didn't live the, you know, kiss alive like I did. You know, my older brother brought it, 
was the one who had that. And I remember listening to it when it was new constantly in our back porch. You know what I mean? So Kiss Kiss had a, di- you're right, Michael, it, it really was maybe the, and I never, I guess I never really, you know, verbalized it that way, but I think you're right. I, I When I really digest that, I, I think that's absolutely right, Mike. That's a good observation. That- Be- because, you know, I, I, I remember for me, I distinctly remember a moment where all of a sudden I realized Gene wasn't really a demon. And it probably wasn't until... It probably wasn't until the Creatures of the Night era because it, you know, and I, I don't know why this one hit me, but it was like a PM Magazine interview and Gene was being interviewed. And all of a sudden he opens his mouth and it sounds very smart and knowledgeable. And then he's an intellect and he can have a, an intelligent conversation. And I'm like, I, I just remember it's like, that's not the demon. That's a banker talking. Yeah, yeah. And he's sitting there in makeup and and full costume, and he's talking all smart. And I'm like, where's the grunts and the growls and the, you know, like like the like the Mike Douglas interview was much more Gene being a character when he did yeah. that Mike Douglas interview, and I don't remember Mark. We had an interview with somebody a long time ago that even mentioned that early on that was an issue Paul and Bill Coyne had with Gene was like, you, you're you coming out of the Gene character when you do your interviews. Right. Um, so I, 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 could see, I could see that happen. It happened for you a little earlier than it happened for me. But, yeah, I think we all had that moment where all of a sudden – we still love the band, but, yeah, but they're in, not in January, superheroes in anymore. In January of 78, I loved the land of hype and glory. I had no problems with Gene sounding smart. I loved that. You know what I mean? I, I remember watching that with my parents, and Kiss didn't come off too stupid. You know what I mean? It was like, see, that's what I like. I, I remember watching the land of hype and glory vividly because it, a, a, you know, it was a news magazine on NBC, and... And I remember why I remember telling my parents like Kiss is going to be on this. You know, it's a it was a big. Keep in mind, dude, again to the younger fans, we had like four channels. I mean, there was no right. cable TV, and, and so when yeah. so when like NBC News was doing a big special on something that happens in our country, you know, it, it people most people tuned into that yeah. sort of. There was nothing else to watch. <laughs> correct. Correct. Right. Again, I, I, we always have to talk about this stuff to our younger fans because they're like, what do you mean? I just would have flipped on, you know, Cartoon Network or something. No, no, no. No, no. So, there was no way out. <laughs> I, I remember that vividly, and that didn't bother me. Um, actually, I was quite proud that my band didn't sound like a bunch of idiots and that my parents kind of got that they were hardworking because my parents are hardworking people. And, you know what I mean? They kind of got that. But, again, if you fast forward to October of 78, I, you know, and I think that's why Paul says to this day, what does he say? God, I remember cringing in the theater when they were doing the, you know, the preview of this. He wanted to crawl out of the place. I mean, they knew. They knew how bad it was. And that's that was my genuine reaction. Because it would have been so much easier for me to go, oh, I loved everything. No, I didn't. You know, and I'm honest about it. it to this day, I can't sit and watch it. When I, I remember when I got the the kissologies I, I watched a little bit with the what do you call it the narration or whatever i'm like yeah but but speaking and, and again this is why i'm fascinated for your book ron i remember getting the kiss magazine about the movie and i yeah. read all those interviews yeah. and i absolutely loved them i thought that i thought me too yeah that, yeah so so i'm really i love finding out do you stuff. think do you think they maybe um too much hype into what this movie was going to be versus what ended up materializing to, to, to say it's kiss meets star Wars. You're going in with a preconceived notion of how cool this is going to be. And when you see the effects that they ended up using in the movie, you're like, yeah, this is pretty much a Saturday morning cartoon level production here yeah this i was is, waiting for dr yeah. smith to walk yeah I mean, e- exactly <laughs> so maybe you know and and i will admit that but i, I appreciated that 
hokiness to some extent. But I could understand yeah. how you thinking this is going to be even Paul thinking this is what they told us it was going to be. And we look at the finished result and it's like, what the hell is that kind of zigging out of my eye? And, you know, yeah. the, you know, the special effects were just lame when you, especially when you compare it to like what the same kiss characters did in their comic book. The comic book was fabulous. It was. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. Both of them. I really, I loved both of them. I love both of them. I, I think the second one is underrated. I think it's really cool. I, I agree with you too, Ron. I think I think the first one's head and shoulders better, but the second one's dynamite. It, it's yeah. really good. Yeah, so, uh, you know, you're saying about Phantom, and what was I saying? What was I going to say? <laughs> we're ta we're totally talking about this <laughs> book you're going to write that, 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 that oh, yeah. Mark's going to love to read because he hates the movie. That's <laughs> right. Totally makes sense. Yes. Me, damn it! <laughs> Thanks, Mark. That's a winning review. I'm putting that on it. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. You know, I think I think 1978 in the Kiss world. And by the way, I I want my life to be like Kiss's 1978. I want to just live it to the fullest. I think it's just the coolest calendar year in history. The only thing we're missing is a full record from them. But a, a full original record. But other than that, wow, what a year in, in rock history for almost any band. But um, I think they just stumbled into it. And I think Bill LaCoyne kind of, you know, put it in his package. Listen, dudes, you're going to get a nice little break. You're going to work on your solo records, solo records. We're going to do this movie. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And I think they just kind of went into it, got into it. And, you know, it's it's anathema. And that's a big word to what they were doing. Big word like gymnasium. Yes, you're going to bed at five. Now you got to be up at five. And I, I just think it was totally opposite to that. So I think it gave them a bad taste in their mouth going into it. And then, uh, I mean, even if you're Kiss, I don't know how you can't figure out, like with Hanna-Barbera involved, I don't know how you can't figure out that maybe it won't be on par with Star Wars. I, I don't know, or Gone with the Wind. You know, I, I think that became a thing. You know, Peter and Ace are not into it. I think there's just so much going on um, to where it just, you know, it's a little revisionist of Paul and it's a little simplistic and reductionist to just say, Hey, look, it's not that, that just, um, hold water as they say operator. Oh, you, 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 you froze up for a split second there. Uh, did I? Yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't freeze. I didn't <laughs> You are you using Mark's router? My router's router. Yeah, I I, I I hacked your router. No, I uh I'm in my basement, so I don't know. So like am I. <laughs> Amber of thrills down here meets. Um, yeah, you're in your basement, right? I am. Office. You you know as you mentioned Hanna Barbera. That's probably a a difference, Mark, between you and I. As a kid. I was nuts. I loved Hanna Barbera stuff. I loved the Sid and Marty Croft stuff, which yeah. clearly is just weird, strange, um, hokey, not top of the line effects. But I absolutely loved it. So to some extent, that did Hanna when Hanna Barbera was going to be involved in the Kiss. That actually excited me. I'm like, oh, that's fucking cool. I love Hanna Barbera. But you can see, to your point, that's what you ended up with. You ended up with a Hanna-Barbera TV show. It was an overriding factor. And I think when you read some of the interviews I've done, uh, that really emerges more than almost anything else on the production side. Uh, that it, it, it was a Hanna-Barbera project, ultimately, you know. And um, I think if Kiss were better... Uh, at what they were trying to do in the movie, I think that would have made a major difference. And I think uh, the editing, you know, and then somebody might say, hey, Ron, it starts the script. And you know what? I agree. It's it's kind of a typical script. There was a lot of mad men running around in the 70s. It was a kind of common thing. But I think even with better editing and if Kiss were uh, a little better in it, I think it really would have tilted it to the point where even if Hanna-Barbera uh, neutered it, watered it down, made it for kids, it would have had a little more snap to it. It feels a little dead on screen, doesn't it, the movie? Well, would you, I, would I you tell you another that? thing, and, and, and I mean this in the most serious way. Michael, like you said, 
before I got into Kiss, there was two things other than sports that I liked. I I, I liked Universal Monsters. Yeah. And I liked Toho Monsters. I liked the Godzillas and I liked the Frankensteins. And I remember like when like the Frankenstein and Wolfman and, and Kiss Meets the Phantom, I'm like, oh, that looks like, I don't know, what was that cheesy show, Mike? You're a big old school t- TV. Um, Land of the Lost? No, 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 no. It was the monster one. Oh, and Dracula and his gang yeah, were like yeah. and they, they used to have like solvers. the librarian. and Yes. Wow, that's uh, obscure. That's obscure. Yeah, very obscure, but I liked yeah. that show, you know. Yeah. God, I can't remember what that was called. Someone will, oh, I, you know, I'll look it up afterwards. But the monsters kind of looked like that, and it was silly, but I liked that as a kid. Yeah. But now I'm watching, you know, this supposed rock and roll movie, and, and I, I, I'm, like, thinking, God, that Frankenstein looks like I did the makeup for it. You know what I mean? It just, it didn't, there was, it, there was no believability. It, 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 it had a hard time um, being done as a live action movie. It, you know, and, and and I think when we reviewed Kiss Meets Kiss Meet Scooby Doo, we were all like, "This is what the fandom should have been. It should have I been like that. this. It should have been animated. It should have been then then the hokiness kind of fits in okay because it's an animated cartoon." But when you're doing live action with live actors and you're like, that didn't work. Um, a real quick Hanna-Barbera side, because as you were talking about this, Ron, um, I don't know if either of you guys are, are fans of the banana splits. Huge. Michael, I'm so disappointed oh, yeah. by what you, what you saw. I so, so I, I, you know, there's a new banana splits movie that's out. It's a horror movie. Yeah, horror yeah. <laughs> movie. So, so Mark, but bear with me, Mark, because a lot of old school Banana Splits fans, because I'm in a Banana Splits group on Facebook, are just like, it's like Kiss. It's like, oh my God, it's not the original Banana Splits. We can't talk <laughs> about this. They suck. They suck. They suck. Well, you know, I just love the Banana Splits so much. I got the movie. It's on Amazon Prime, and it's a horror movie. And as I'm watching it. I'm like, and it's Hanna Barbera. Remember, Hanna Barbera controls banana splits. I'm like, wow, this has a feel of Kiss Meets the Phantom, and and why I picked that out was, so they're at this giant movie studio, watching the banana splits TV show being filmed. Sort of has a going to an amusement park. There's an audience there. There's the Banana Splits characters, but it turns out the characters are all robots. And there's this evil janitor who built them and controls them and programs them and programmed them to be evil and go out <laughs> and kill. That's and I mean, the, 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 <laughs> and, and the violence and the gore, it's like top notch. <laughs> it's freaking off the hook just like oh my god this is not kid friendly anymore but it was I, just like that boy, turns this, me off it feels like a kiss meets the phantom movie in 2019 it was like can right. we just pick up right. the very basic plot line an evil guy builds these robots they go crazy i'm like can we talk kiss meets the phantom here are the great how, girls how, in dev- it? how devastated would it be, or would you be, if H.R. Puff and stuff was now violent, and I, Jimmy I, the Whistle was, you know, poking people's eyes you know, out? I mean, the truth. Right. The, tru- the truth is, <laughs> I, would, I, would, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be devastated because I love those properties so much that I viewed it as, if my favorite property is back getting f- attention, awesome. I was there when it started. And, yeah, you know, every band has their Elder album and their Carnival of Souls album, and they go off yeah. the... But it's still my band. It's still my property. I still love, uh, I still love uh, these guys. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example of... Because Banana Splits and H.R. Puff and stuff and all, that has a certain, you know, a place in my heart. And it goes back to what I heard somebody say. My, my son's 27 now. But when he was three or four years old, he absolutely loved Barney the Dinosaur, you know. 
Yeah. And I remember somebody in my presence was like putting down Barney, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know what? How many things, especially in this day and age, are as wholesome and good and nice? I said, that's sadly lacking in our society. I said, so <laughs> nice. Wow. So, so, that is cool. Well, so I said, you know what? I'm fine with Barney being, you know, the nice, peaceful character. I said, it's going to be a part of my son's childhood that will always be special, and I wouldn't want it perverted. And that's the same thing now with the banana splits. I don't want that perverted. I, I want it. And I mean that in the true definition of the word. It's perverted now. It, it It's no longer the wholesome, good, you know, you have nothing to worry about sort of thing. But, but, I, but you know, I rationalize it in my mind as they were evil because the evil janitor programmed them to be that way and took over their minds. <laughs> and the sequel will right, have right. their minds released and they will come back and be the nice, happy, cuddly banana splits that we all love. Eh, Happen to kiss. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, think... we've, we've kind of hijacked this, and, and I'm, I'm most at fault. But, Ron, let's talk about your book. I'm so sorry. We, we went it's off all right. of the tangent. It's gotta, all my fault. I just wanted to know, are the grape girls in that movie? The grape girls. They're like the neighbors that would invade no. every now and then, and nope. they would dance and then disappear. No. No? No. Nope. All right. So, uh, and another another good. I've just a couple of random thoughts here. Doctor Shrinker was an awesome Croft show. I remember Doctor Shrinker. I don't remember that one. I don't remember that one. Well, the guy that played that. Who was Doctor Shrinker, Mike? Oh, God, great actor. Yeah. See, I don't re I don't remember the actors, but I remember I, like I remember the, the show. He shrunk Mark. down a bunch of kids, really small. Yes. And they were running. Or they he was constantly chasing them in his house. It was it was like uh, that Rick Moranis movie, but. Decades earlier. He's a little Devereaux-esque, too, yeah. I would say. Like, especially in his, his dress, his wardrobe. But uh, you asked about the book, and funny enough, I have some information about it. Um, yeah, you know, so I started writing this thing in the early 2000s, and uh, I was going and going. I was interviewing, finding people in the early internet age, hard to find people. I'm calling the Screen Actors Guild, asking for actors' names and editors' names and this and that. And I eventually uh, chalked up 14 interviews, 14 interviews over about a year and a half. Uh, I just stopped working on it and other things took hold my business and I started having kids and yada yada so um, these have been sitting in my basement uh, forever hopefully and you digitized them a long time ago yeah they are digitized uh, but I, I wanted to hold these for dramatic effect <laughs> and they were just sitting in my basement and every now and then I'd shuffle them and move them you know how it is and then one time I, I just took a look at it and I In, in book form maybe there's a publisher out there that would actually do this and i remembered this online publisher bear manor media and bear manor media uh is committed to doing books um either by the people themselves or or people like me writing about something about all facets of pop culture um they have stuff like um the definitive episode guide to petrocelli the early 70s uh lawyer show <laughs> Starring Barry Newman. Yeah. <laughs> or they have uh, the bionic reconstructed book about the $6 million man. Okay, that one I could get. And may maybe if you're into Roscoe from the Dukes of Hazzard, James Best, well, there's a book about him. There's books about the Flintstones, all kinds of great books. So I got in touch with the guy knowing how cool he is doing all this stuff. And he says, Kiss? I really don't do stuff like that. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> So so anyway, I just tried to tell him, I said, hey, I told him the whole saga that I've got these interviews. I just want to get the interviews out there. They're sitting here in my basement, and I think there's some good stuff on them. And, you know, let me just get them out there. So we thought about it, and he said, Ron, I think it's an awesome idea. So uh, we, we signed a deal to do it, and I've been plugging away at it. Uh, and then this past oh, three months or so, in earnest, I've really been working and out of earnest uh, doing this book. And I finished uh, transcribing all the interviews. Uh, and I do have the list, the final list of interviews, if you'd like to hear them. Yeah, yeah. please. Who? 
three sides exclusive, you know. Uh, let me let, say, let, let, gonna... let, before you go down yes, the list, sir. let's just the biggest question. Did you get the black ace? Black ace might be in conversations with phantoms too. But that's getting ahead too. <laughs> Short answer, no. Okay. But all right, here, here's, and actually I'm reading from what is the tentative table of contents. Here's who I have. And, and remember, this project was something I had worked on, and then I just kind of stopped. So a lot of this was a work in progress, but this is what I ended up with before I stopped. Bill a coin on the KISS side. Bill a coin, C.K. Lem. Uh, both script writers, Jan Michael Sherman and Don Boudet. Um, on the art side, uh, James Hulsey, the art director, uh, who designed uh, the lab and designed the Chamber of Thrill sets, uh, and also Barry Levine, uh, on-site photography, of course. Uh, on uh, movie makers, behind the scenes, Terry Morse, the producer, Deke Hayward, the executive in charge of production for Hanna-Barbera, and of course, uh, I have Gordon Hessler, the director. And as, in terms of on-screen people, I have Carmine Caridi, uh, Michael Bell, as previously mentioned, I have a short convo with Mary Kay Morse, the girl on Pyramid, Don Lewis, and Lisa Jane Persky, otherwise known as Dirty D. So that's the 14 interviews I have, and those comprise a bulk of the book. And then on top of it, I have Phantom Findings, which uh, are a, a series of, of writings I've done uh, through the years about that, just backing up a little bit uh, to make the circle complete. We were talking about Kiss Asylum. And Mike, you probably will remember, it's probably in the recesses of your mind, but I used to write the Kiss Thought Vault yep. uh, for Kiss Asylum. And these, again, were just a series of essays having fun about various Kiss topics, uh, saying how great Peter's Out of Control is, writing like 15,000 words about it, uh, things like that, or writing just about double platinum. And in the spirit of the movie, and in the way that I could probably write best in a way that entertains KISS fans, these are funny things about the movie, lending itself to the campy nature of the movie. You know, I'm a big Star Trek fan, and uh, there is something still online called the uh, Star Trek Nitpickers Guild. And I love to nitpick things and really go through. I'm still discovering stuff about KISS meets the Phantom. And these are things I'm kind of pointing out and... Um, hopefully entertaining as well as informing about it. Are these sort of like little Easter eggs, little did you knows, little gaffes and goofs? They're, they're that, Mike, and they're also things like a nice exploration of Paul Stanley's powers in the movie. <laughs> okay. I think in the movie, people might go to Gene, but I think Paul emerges as being the greatest superhero of all of them. And that's not just because of his dancing he literally does while walking under the Colossus. He literally dance walks. Did you ever notice that? It's so great. It's so 70s. But, um, yeah, so things like that, Mike, short things and, and longer things, uh, depending on whatever I can kind of cram into the book. Are there, can, can you give us one or two of the more interesting, um, more exciting ones that you've found? No. <laughs> no, actually, <laughs> a few Granville. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I already just did. You know, I, I think uh, you got to buy the book, right? But I think uh, the Paul thing is interesting. Uh, and what else is in there, too? Um, what can I say? Well, you know what? Getting back to the Paul thing, that. Oh, thank you, the, Mark. When, thank you. Thank you. Su no, Super Kiss was supposed to, and, and when, when we had uh, John on was supposed yeah. to have that laser that came out of his eye, which was, you know, from the yes. movie. Yep. And and yeah, that was supposed to happen on the Dynasty tour. So I like how there was some carryover, you know. Uh, when you talk about Phantom, it's interesting. It's like a door opened, here was the movie, a door closed. You know, of course, there was no merchandising except for the magazine. And, you know, it, it was like a small TV thing. And Kiss not having the rights and having their focus being on things like the solo records – 
it just was kind of almost like a non-event in, in a way in terms of how KISS would unveil things and, and roll out things at the time. So it's awesome when you actually see things like Paul, yes, revisiting that or some uh, phantom style posing in the Viewmasters. You know, I, I yes, love yeah, I didn't yeah. think about that. You're absolutely right. And while we're here on trivia, what is the name of the villain in the color forms? Anybody know? No, oh, no idea. They're right there. I can go look. <laughs> no, you cannot. No lifelines. Uh, it is the Mad Rock Promoter. The Mad Rock Promoter? Yes. He looks like Sinestro a little bit, but yeah, he uh, wreaks havoc in vinyl form. I didn't even know, you know, I've got the color forms, but I got them right. at... Throw, to throw records at people or something? Yes. I, yes. I, I, given... I, I got I got them after they first came out. You know, I was well past the, the target audience for them, so... I never, ever paid attention that there were actually characters or storylines or something as part of it. Those I, I are did, again, of, my, I yeah. had a younger brother, and I, re, I remember getting, he, he was getting those things for, like, Christmas and his birthday and stuff. Because, he, again, he wanted them. So, right. but, and I still loved Kiss, so I'd check them out, you know what I mean? But I, you know. So you'd reluctantly play with the color forms I just, just play to with them, connect was, with your brother, right? I was right? aware of them. <laughs> They're kind of a carryover stylistically from the comic book somewhat. Yeah. Um, yeah. Art, art wise too. Art wise too. I think they're an underrated collectible actually. Um, I think they're a lot cooler than the rub and play set. I have to say that. It's it, to me, that's, it's all part of it. Uh, you know, one of the things that I love about the seventies stuff as yeah. a collector is it was never meant to be kept. It was all meant to be played with. So to find, to find that stuff and it, have it not all be used is, you know. I, I was just going to say it's it's fairly difficult to find a full color forms set in yeah. good condition that isn't missing pieces because, as you said, Mark, kids played with them. Ah, you know, mm. mom vacuumed up the the Ace Fraley. It's gone. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, that, that's the difference between the Spencer stuff, which, you know, they wouldn't, you know, they wrote it, they physically wrote on it, you know, instant collectible and stuff yeah. like, no, it isn't, you know, I mean, anything mass produced that's a collectible isn't really too collectible now, is it? We, and, and we're all buying two or three of them, you know, with the Spencer stuff. We yeah. knew, you know. I, I have some friends. Fortunately, I was not one of them. I, I have a friend of mine. Who must have I don't know fifty cases of those fucking McFarlane? Oh God, oh, there, you know, there's what? an investment that didn't pay off. You, know. <laughs> they, you can't even give them away, and and you, they were a letdown. They were a letdown. I, I, I think, agree. I, I agree a hundred percent. Yes, I I did not like the image. I I thought the whole McFarlane thing was quite frankly pretty. You stupid. know what? I, and and I'm the opposite. I loved, I loved the first set of McFarlane action figures. Um, yes. And I loved the Psycho Circus comic book because it just made Kiss look badass. I mean, they just looked phenomenal, especially in the McFarlane action figures. Now, when they went to the second set and all this other, it was like, okay, now you've you've jumped the shark. Um, that first set. You don't like you, the Psycho Circus set? <laughs> Peter, a lion tamer, or there, whatever it you was. know, and and oh, it's yeah. the special yeah. tour edition. You get a gold record in there. It's like, please, <laughs> right. you know that it 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 would have been cool to have just one set of new figures, and then just leave it at that. But then McFar, you know, and I can't blame them. They realized there was a lot of demand for it, so let's do a second set, and then let's do the alive figures. Which you know make a good appearance and out in the streets the the original Kiss Crow <laughs> book. <laughs> By the way, Mike, did you see the uh, a nice little uh, news item? I, I so wanted to call. I'm watching the eleven o'clock news last night, and they said that I ninety four in Michigan is the most deadliest highway. <laughs> And I'm like that will forever it's a little, be. It's a little fucking joke between Mike and I. And that'll uh, forever be an inside Kiss <laughs> Crew joke, won't it? So I, I I literally like got a big smile on they, my face. Are they going to put a like a plaque in the ditch in honor of the original <laughs> Kiss crew? <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, I digress. But yeah, yeah, you, you, you know, I I I I wasn't a big fan of uh, the McFarlane stuff, and it, again, it, it it didn't 
it, you know, I guess it's you can kind of tie it in with the Kiss Meets the Fan of the Park thing. Is it? It just didn't. It just didn't capture Kiss the way that I. I wanted them, I guess, you know. Um, yeah, you know, know, you know what, were, what, what you know. disappointed me was I wish that the actual costumes that the band wore on tour would have matched the action figures closer. Yeah. To me, that would have seemed like a very cool tie-in. It's interesting because Kiss has so many uh, – they're so 70s in a big way. So, you know, the boots and, and Paul's hairy chest and, you know, these are very – 70s elements you know that this band has and then companies go and do try to uh bring it into the present a little bit and sometimes it hits and sometimes it misses sometimes with kiss themselves it hits i think the updates on the costumes were pretty cool you know that they've done since monster i i think it's pretty cool but you know those things i think everybody was in the reunion mode and they were you know it was this retro thing and then when that was one of the first things that came out of the gate, when fans were clamoring to spend their money, they were dying to spend their money. And a few Kiss things that came out around that time just sold by virtue of people wanting more. Yeah, you know, you're 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 right about that. You know, and and hit or miss is true because, you know, as much as we sit here and go, you might like or not like the McFarland figures, but now the latest group of kiss action figures have all been much more retro yeah 70s looking and i look at those and i go good lord they look like crap and boy are the people complaining about them i i I made a decision as as a collector i i am no longer collecting anything that doesn't involve the band but that's for me I, i always like to tell you know especially the people who watch the show if you like going to collect all that stuff at spencer's or whatever target or i, I think it's cool i mean it, it it fills up your shelf it's cool you don't have to spend a million dollars to do it i get it but at, at this stage of the game i just like paying homage to the band you know what i mean like i, I you know a couple weeks ago ron i was fortunate enough to finish my casablanca gold record i mean actual gold record oh, awards wow. so you know that's what i mean so I, i'd rather spend a little bit more money on getting something that means something to me. Because I, I got to admit, I, I was like what you were just talking about. I, I remember when the reunion tour started, I was going to Spencer's once a week. I was, yeah, you know, whatever was. And then I, I finally, I got to admit, I went, you know, am I a lemming or something? What the fuck is this? I, you know, because I just remember putting something down. I think it was the chip and dip bowl. So I said, like, this is stupid. <laughs> oh, God. No, 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 I really did. I right, had right. like an epiphany. I'm like, I don't need this. I, it's, it's just dumb. You know, I mean, this has no connection to the band. This isn't. I, 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 I was working with them when all, all of that stuff started coming out. So during the reunion tour and the early McFarland stuff, it, it, it was okay with me. I, I liked it because it didn't seem to have gone over the edge yet. But once Psycho Circus hit and then that whole Spencer's campaign where you're like, yeah, the chip and dip set. Or I, I remember, and I had them because they, you know, they had samples at, at, at work, like the Kiss incense box, the Kiss stash box. And I'm just like, what the hell is a stash box? Why did I buy this? Yeah. Or, wow. or, or, or the Kiss baseball. Really? A baseball? What, what yeah, the yeah. frick do I need? Because I, I just have this sitting on my... A and plate, I, every time a I look at it and I go, this is stupid. So I like know. the golf cloth so you can dry oh, your God, hands off. I remember off. the golf cloth. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you have the snow globe? The snow um, globe is pretty do. cool, I actually. I do. The kiss snow globe. Snow that, globe. That, snow that's, globe. That's, <laughs> that's when I took Mark's attitude and I said, okay... Now I'm just going to get the stuff that it means something to me that I care about because Con- concert posters, stuff yeah. like you know anything that has to do with the tour and the band and the music they play and that I'm still super geeky into. But you know if they come out like and again it's not that they're not I want to stress it, it's not that they're not cool or not collectible or I, look again if you, if you like that stuff it's don't tell me neither i'm not going to tell you not to collect it i think it's cool and and, and again i I think especially for younger fans by all means if you want to start a kiss room now's the time and you can you can find 
you know, ten ten dollar items for a hundred bucks. You can fill up a nice shelf, and and that's cool as hell. But again, just being older, I don't know what. I, I it just that's really doesn't the tchotchke thing doesn't do anything for me. I, I always called it trinkets and trash. That's you know yeah. pencils, erasers, magnets, stickers, all of the little crappy stuff that. I mean, and there was just, there was so much of it. And that, that was part of what also bothered me is there became so much of it that you couldn't even stay on top of what was coming out. Mike, you know, I'm, I'm looking That's up true. at some pretty silly, like that you're talking about the baseball. Cause I have, this is, I'm insane over here. I mean, I've got the rafters in my basement. Everything has got, <laughs> I don't know if I can give you a, a good yeah, let me see, the dude. rafters. Oh, you got the kiss air duct. Yeah. <laughs> Can you see? Can you see how like the rafters are? I love it. It's the original Ace Fraley silver ducks. Yeah. You know, and then I, like over here. Yeah. You know, what am I looking? I think what the baseball's work? right there, or something, or you know. But I also got cool stuff like there's the the uh, the double platinum arrow. Oh, dude! I have my double platinum arrow over here. Wait, can I? But I but my my point is a lot of that Spencer's crap or there's whatever. my double platinum arrow. There see you it? go. Nice. Now but, we go on. Okay. But you know, a lot of the the, the like the baseball and the, right. the crap. I ended up getting that a lot of that stuff when I'd buy collections. It just, just, and it, I just hung extras. on to things that I didn't have. Right. But I don't I I physically made again, it was pre psycho circus. I'm like, I'm not collecting this stuff. But you know what I did collect, Mike, and we've talked about it on the show, is like the ticket wheel. Because to me that was more related to the band it wasn't related to tchotchke so much what is the ticket wheel um on the psycho <laughs> on the psycho circus tour yeah. you know they started doing all of these framed collectibles and this was when um if you remember a company called cal gold was around and they were making the fake gold albums so the, t the ticket wheel was literally just like i don't know an ad, an ad mat, yep. and then extra ticket stubs that the band got from Ticketmaster. It for had like, like every, every ticket of the tour every, yeah, in a in circle. A, in a circle. That's pretty cool. Well, that's what I mean. I thought it looked yeah. cool. And like it artistically, you know. It wasn't a baseball. It looked, you know what I mean? It looked, <laughs> it, and again, Mike, I don't know. I, I'm, I'll tell you the person's name after we're done because I don't want. I remember some because i knew who you were we weren't friends or anything but i knew who you were as you know and he's like yeah i talked because you were working at sony at the time and he's like i talked to Brandvold, and he said they only sold like you know whatever 15 of them oh, whatever you, you, that, it, it's true those things didn't sell and a lot of times they just made them in the warehouse as orders came in um if you remember back this is one of my favorite and craziest stories when you think about it on the reunion tour, they sold this. It was it was a, a nice cardboard poster with a big white mat around it that was autographed by the four original guys yeah. on the bottom. And basically, they just autographed a bunch of mats. They autographed mm -hmm. like 500 of these mats, and then they just drop a picture in. They didn't sell all of them. So they ended up having, we had a warehouse filled with autographed mats. And I'm just like, good Lord, there's got to be some gold sitting here. You've got the four original guys' autographs on, beautiful autographs on this nice big, like, six-inch yeah. mat on the bottom that you could put a, whatever poster you wanted they put into the, it. They put the destroyer thing on that. Is what so they did. That, that, you know, that's, that's what they were doing a lot back then is they were creating these awards these plaques yeah. and then they try and here's the problem they try and sell them for like four hundred dollars yeah. and go yeah. it's a limited edition numbered by numbered 500 and the funny thing is i knew the secretary in the office who would fill out the certificate of authenticity whenever an order came in <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, re I remember I got I got my ticket window through a mutual friend of ours, and uh, we got them for half off or whatever. Wow! And, 
How I big is it? Is it like a poster size or, um, or like square or? No, it's like rectangle. It's like something you'd hang like a picture. Yeah, like it's, it, it was a nice. It was a nice size, cool. and it and it yeah. and it would look it would look nice hanging well, there. Well, but well, I think I this think is, this is. <laughs> This is this is not the ticket window. I showed this but on the show, a, but it's, it's a, a similar type of thing. Okay. Yeah. 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 You right. know, the ticket window was si similar to this, except it had a circle of tickets on it. And again, you know, you know, same thing like Mike was talking. Here's the certificate of authenticity on the back, and uh, you know, I, I still have it. You know, when it's an original plastic. And again, you know what? It, hey, um, Mark, is there a is there a name on that certificate of authenticity? I have to turn the light. Yeah, there is. Um, to looks like Billy. Joel Weinbacker. Uh, she's, uh, she's on the next episode of Three Sides. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the funny part about this, though, again, going back, this commemorated Dodger Stadium. There's, like, Dodger Stadium oh, photos. There's a canceled uh, stamp. A canceled stamp from the day of the gig. And I, I just thought it was cool. And, and I remember, like I said, my friend and I got these through Sony. And my friend talked physically talked to Michael because I remember that conversation. He's like... Oh, if you buy, you know, whatever, because my friend was selling stuff, too, and he had, uh, you know, the tax ID number. So he was buying, like, one, you know, one extra one for himself so he could sell the other one for, you know, at normal price. He, then he'd get his for free. And he was telling me, you know, what the hell will make the order a little bit bigger if you want to get, you know, I can get these things through Sony Signatures. And that's what we did, man. And But I like stuff like that. I thought it was more cool again like i said than a baseball or you know air guitar strings or something it commemorated the first night of the psycho circus star so you got you and you got to keep in mind if you looked at that and paid attention the cost to make that next to nothing is like oh. probably a buck because it's it's right. all paper goods it's yep. it's all and, and it's, it's an old it's, and the laser copy is not that good. <laughs> right right exactly so uh, the, the margin the margins on those things were enormous yeah. I, I will tell you um you're both alice cooper fans right yeah Ron, sure. i know oh, we yeah. like a lot of the same music um yeah i bought Love. that alice cooper box set with the school desk have you guys seen it yeah you know, you know what i'm talking about yeah i about spit when i fucking i was so pissed because it was supposed to and it does it has reproductions of like the killer tour book and all that that yeah. shit looked like someone did that at Kinko's at two in the morning. Uh, and I'm like, you know what? For the fucking money I'm paying for this thing, this shouldn't look like this. And it really bothered me. And say what you will about Kiss for the most part. You know, like the Gene Simmons vault is badass. I mean, they did a nice job on the binding. The pictures look great. I mean, yeah, is it expensive? And yeah, I get it. But you know what? I don't mind paying for quality. Right. That kind of stuff bothered me, which goes back to this ticket window. And this what, thing. what about um? What about quality songs? I don't. I love quality songs. Sorry, doing? Mike, you could edit that out. <laughs> do you do you have a vault or did you? Uh... I didn't get a vault, but I kind of like that product. I I kind of thought the product of the vault was really cool. It's a fascinating listen. Again, you know, like you, I'm a musician. I I I yeah. get demos. I I understand what it's like to put a drum loop on if you're Gene and you just, you know, play an open E as you sing something over it, trying <laughs> yeah, to yeah, flush yeah. an idea. No, I get it. That's yeah, what it. Totally. That's how yeah. you guys. That's how you write songs, or that's how you flush an idea out. So I'm all for that. I, I and again, I find it a fascinating listen, especially. Um, if you, and that's the one thing I, they didn't do in the, they didn't do a good job with on the vault. It's really my only complaint. They didn't put everything in chronological order. I, I think it makes a whole lot more sense as a listener to put it in chronological order. You know what I mean? They yeah, did look yeah. things, but it, it jumps all over the place. You know what I mean? And, and, and especially the, the bonus disc at the end, it's, it's literally, it's like they took a gun and, you know, they shot yeah. different, <laughs> you know, different years all over the place. And, you know, it doesn't have any continuity. And I, I think if there's one thing Kiss fans like, it's continuity. You like things to go in chronological order. You know, yeah. you, you don't want hot in the shade stuff after love gun you know what i mean and, and i don't know if you guys do this sort of thing whenever i i make playlists on my i still use another poem when, whenever you um make play i i don't like i have the first 
six Kiss records into like its own, you know, plus, excuse me, plus side four of Alive Two. All I I don't want to hear that with unmasked stuff. It it doesn't fit. It, my my OCD goes fucking crazy. I don't <laughs> I don't want that. Right, right. And that's how I have like you know all all my stuff. Like I I I like UFO a lot, but my UFO is broken into Chapman and Shanker. <laughs> right. I don't want to hear Chapman stuff when I'm listening to Shanker. So I, that's yeah. just you know what I mean. I'm just really really weird that way. And that was the only thing about the vault I I didn't like. I I wish it would have been one continuous listen all the way through almost like a storybook you know this is where i started here's where i am yeah if you want to if you really you know it's funny they talked about gene's songwriting earlier on in the vault's life it seemed and then it was kind of de-emphasized marketing wise but what you're saying is interesting i would love to get into that chronologically and say where was his head at you know, when he was writing material for Rock and Roll Over, which there's a lot of demos for. You know, I would like to just stay in that headspace of that record for that song or two and then move on chronologically to what he was doing the next year. So I think you're right. I, I think um, it wasn't something that was super emphasized as time went on about The Vault. It was more of a selling of the experience, per se. I, I was very lucky because I did the very the, the second Vault experience. And from what the vault has turned into now, and, and again, if you get a chance to get a vault, you want one, go. But I, I liked the Wild West feel of ours, and I understand why yeah, yeah. it had to change. No, because it, ours, you, whatever you brought, Gene signed, and he'd sign your vault, and it was yeah. just a great, great experience. Well, again, it was more of a free-for-all, whereas now it's a lot more regulated it's yeah. you know what i mean you, he'll sign your one or two things and but to be honest it has to be that way it, it really yeah. does otherwise it but i you know our gene was a lot less corporate at at the second right. one let me just tell you it was it was he really was in plus it was all new to him it was all fresh who was he, at that one as a guest no one not in detroit i would say matter yeah. of fact I flew home early from Atlanta because I went to the, right. the expo. Vinny was there, and I had you a, flew home early after disrupting the Vinny Vincent Q and A. That's a that's a whole nother <laughs> laugh fest right there. Yeah. Hey Zach, we got you covered, man. <laughs> exactly. I I was in a cab when we supposedly disrupted everything, but, <laughs> but yeah, I, I flew home yeah. early for that. And uh, what a what an incredible. Gene was in great form that day, and yeah. uh, we he played some songs. Matter of fact, uh, he looked at me, was, you know, because th- someone said something about a, a song. He's like, eh, well, three sides of the coin, right? And he pointed at me. Wow. That, that, yeah, that kind of silly, goofy yeah, stuff. Fun stuff. That's awesome. Was, was, did, so, he, did he ask you how the Vinny thing went by chance? Did he want to uh, know? You know what? I, 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 one of the coolest parts about that day, and, and it's on YouTube, I, I interviewed Gene for like 20 minutes uh, for three sides of the coin. But it was just a one-on-one, just him and I. But before that happened, while they were getting things set up, Gene was Gene, meaning he didn't have his sunglasses on. We were having a very deep conversation about religion and just very worldly things. I, I love good discussions like that. And we had a really, really deep conversation. And I remember um, when it was time to get started, he turned that fucking switch right off yep put sunglasses on and right now i'm but it was weird because i was just so taken aback because we're having again this very deep political world sort of discussion for a good 20 minutes and yeah. my wife is just sitting there as gene and i are going back and forth and and and, and then they're like okay we're ready okay that's it get, get and he's literally just on. Put the glasses yeah. on, put them put them on and now we're now it's all hey babe it's it's talk about the vault and but that's what he's supposed to do you know what yeah. I mean? When I had um when I had worked with him a little bit when he was doing tongue, I had a similar experience actually when he appeared at a tattoo convention in Jersey. I was his photographer for the day, and uh, like you're saying, he comes in and he's in full Gene character, and then somebody said Gene wants you to walk him around the convention so he can check things out. So for the next like hour, he and I made our way around. And like you're saying, he kind of slipped into being a guy. And then when he found out I'm a school teacher, he wanted to talk. And boy, did we talk. We were on the loading dock, leaving this place, waiting for his limo. 
in Secaucus, New Jersey, and he was asking me question after question about school teaching. How do you do it? Um, of course, he mentioned he was a school teacher. Did you know I was a school teacher? I'm like, yeah, I kind of knew that, you know. And um, but he was really into it, like you said, uh, conversating, which was really uh, a different and unique kind of experience for sure. What do you teach, Ron? I, I, my son's a high school teacher. Oh, wow. Yeah, I teach uh, elementary school and I teach technology uh, nice. to kids. Yeah, in grades uh, first through sixth. Whatever they're paying you, it's not enough. That's right. And I, I just do it to get out of the house, you know. You want an audience, <laughs> right? But they just don't applaud enough. Nobody <laughs> clapped. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I tell you what, you know what, it's, it's, it's a, it's, the most important job that you can have, I think, or one of the most important jobs. And, uh, you know, God bless you for doing it again. You know, uh, my, my son, my son's been doing it for it's his third year in teaching now and he loves it, but I see some of the shit he's got to go through sometimes. Yeah, and it just, yeah. I'm like, it's, you know, he, I, I'm sure you have to do the same thing. I can't believe how much he is, because I was always have this kind of little saying, like, if you're forced to volunteer, it's not volunteering, is it? Right. He, he, man, he spent his Labor Day volunteering doing, I mean, I'm, he does it with a smile on his face, but I'm like, son, if you're forced to do something, that's, it's not volunteering at that point, is it? But, yeah, school, school teaching's tough stuff. It, uh, this is my 20th year, and, uh, the tenure. good news, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The good news is, in another forty-six years, I can retire. <laughs> you know? so. But yeah, man, you know, uh, Gene was like really into that. You know, I, Alan Tuller, who was the publisher of, of right. Tongue at the time, uh, he came from the Metal Edge world. Yep. Remember that? Yep. And uh, it was just me, him, and Gene. And he's like, Gene wants to talk to you about school teaching. <laughs> and I told him you're a teacher, and that's how it went. And um, it was interesting to see that. Uh, he really had a passion for it, Gene, apparently, when you talk to him about that. That was one thing that really stuck with me about it, uh, that he's really interested in that industry, and he really wanted to know about it. Really cool to see it yet again, you know, another side of, of him like that. Well, I, so, I, I, I was going to say, let's let's get back to this book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I got something to promote here. Yeah, you're not well, doing a good gene. Yeah, justice you're right. Here. Right now, the only thing on our plate is a live three. Remember, he said that on Rock Live or something. <laughs> People were asking him all kinds of questions. No, but I've been writing away on this book: conversations with phantoms, uh, interviews about the 1978 TV movie Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park. So I finished all the interviews. They are all edited. Uh, I've been writing away on my phantom findings, uh, and I've also created an audio trailer for the book that I'd like to world premiere right here on three sides. We, we, uh, will, we will have it in this episode. Cool. Yeah. I, I really wanted to, to bring that to you guys uh, because you guys have really, uh, as you know, matched the enthusiasm about this, you know, uh, I, I think you get it. And I think that's great. And I think when, Everybody hears this this audio trailer I've put together. I think they'll get the idea of where I'm coming from uh, with this. You know, I, I really want to, uh, as as Calvin Richard says, reflect the spirit of the park. You know, in the book, I, I want it to be fun. Um, and some of the interviews are serious. You know, some of them go into areas I didn't really think they would as I went back and listened to them because that's part of the fear of of going back in time on a project like this. Um, Hey, w was I a good writer or was I a good interviewer at the time? Did I know what I was doing? Um, and I think I, I came off okay enough, A, and B, these interviews are, you know, 18 years ago. So memories were more intact. Um, although I do want to say, you know, a lot of these were first contact phone calls. Like, hey, how you doing? We finally reached. Maybe we'd exchange an email and then I would call up somebody and I just would start asking them questions, the idea would have been to do a follow-up after that. But nonetheless, um, at the time, again, you're talking 2000, 2001, 2002, memories were still fresher. And on a somewhat macabre note, 
uh, many of these people are no longer with us. Yeah. Did, did we? Who was who it that just recently passed away? Carmine Carini Car passed Carmine, away. Carmine, yeah. Yeah, and he was, I think he was the first interview I did, or, or at least one of the very first. And uh, that's, that's a great interview. I, I really like going back and listening to that. I was surprised transcribing and everything. You know, this project's a little different. You know what I mean? I, I, I started it all these years ago. It's kind of sat there. So again, there is a little bit of that apprehension. Is this good enough to put out? And after hearing it, I, I'm pretty excited about it. I think everybody's going to really dig it. Um, interviews uh, with guys like Deke Hayward, who sadly passed away, oh boy, like a month after I interviewed him. Um, his interview was great. And, and again, like a very all-encompassing thing about Phantom. I, I think when you listen to these interviews, um, at the very least, you'll be entertained by it. Uh, but beyond that, I think you'll continue to get a good picture of the project as a whole, apart and aside from Gene and Paul's feelings. You right. know, um, this goes right around what they were thinking. People used to say to me, hey, did you get Gene or Paul for the book, you know, back in the day? And while that would be awesome if Gene called me tonight and said, let's put something together, of course, um, I always said they'd be the last guys I, I'd want to talk to about this. You know, I want to talk to Don Lewis, who was the hunchback of Notre Dame in the Chamber of Thrills. I want to know how his days on set were, what he saw, what he picked up, you know? I, you know, the memories of, of Kiss um, at that point, you know, they, they were all weary, you know? This was a, a foreign project to them. You know, they really didn't come off uh, from it. Even today, it's interesting how they tow that line they really, you know, as time goes by in life, right, you only remember the good stuff. You know, maybe there was something good that came out of that experience for them. But even to this day, Paul really sticks to the ethos that he hated the thing, you know. So well, there's three um, things that Paul yeah. sticks and to. And so does way. Mark Ciccini, by the way. <laughs> yeah. No, but the, think about Paul's interviews. You said something that's very telling because people say that to, to us. And I'm like, well, if Paul Stanley does an interview on three sides, not that we wouldn't love to have him, we would. But yeah. are you going to learn anything? Because he's what? What? what yeah. What story is he going? You're. You're. Let's put it this way. You're rolling the dice that you will be so lucky that something brand new will be revealed that has never yeah. been revealed before, and the odds of that happening are a million to one. But when you That's interview all, it'll be. all the people around the Kiss Enterprise. Yeah. That's where you pick up, as you said, what was it like being there? What did you remember? Did you sense any tension? Did you sense any enjoyment? That's when you get the, f the, the real, you know, the minutia comes out. You know, I like the idea of peeking through the window, looking at this thing unfold yep. through the eyes of these people that were so jazzed and excited to be a part of it. You know, you just reminded me of something, too. I think Bill Coin's interview here is really cool. And, and the one thing, you know, you asked me, you know, for something before, um, his love of kiss is so abundantly apparent in this interview, how he loved the four of them completely. You really sense that, um, in this interview. And, and that's something that I'm just, uh, so happy to put out there, you know, and adding to that record that he was, you know, somebody that really, uh, Loved all four of them equally. You could tell he didn't play favorites with Kiss. And they loved him. And they loved yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. They're very vocal about that. Hey, what I what I wanted to talk to you about a second ago is, speaking of Paul Stanley's history, oh, yeah. you notice there's three things that he pretty much rails against every time. One of them is the movie. The yes. other is the elder. And the the 80s stuff, he's, he's talking about, you know, I did the best I could, but I was... You know, I was a yeah. man unto himself. I mean, you know, it was tough. Gene wasn't around. and You know, Kiss is so good. They're so good at it that, yeah, it can get frustrating. You know, they have their narrative, you know, and, and Gene and Paul doggedly stick to that. I would love to uh, peel back the layers and, and, and really get some good stuff out of Paul. And, and you know, the other thing, too, and, and this is not a slight on anybody that's out there, but I think, you know, you need a journalist that's maybe um, not so much of a KISS fan 
that will stand up to him, so to speak, and really try to get something out of him. You know, when you interview somebody, if they don't say something the first time, you kind of have to circle back. You have to maybe couch it a different way and, and get something out of them. A, a good example of that is when I spoke to Ace about uh, doing the liner notes for Anomaly uh, Deluxe. And when I, when I finally got a hold of him, it was funny. We played phone tag. And when I did get him live on the phone, he was at the Hard Rock in Vegas. And he said, uh, if I lose you, it's because I'm pacing around my hotel room and the reception isn't good. <laughs> so we disconnected like twice. We called each other back. And, you know, Ace was, was ready to talk about it. But you could tell that he had his talking points about the anomaly experience. And I kept working on it a little bit, you know, and um, actually by the end of the conversation, he was like, you know, thank you. That was a really cool interview. I think we really covered some different kind of ground that I didn't expect to. And, you know, I, I think Paul is, you know, would be an even tougher nut to crack. But I think um, a good journalist could help there um, that knows their salt about Kiss to maybe get something fresh out of him. That, again, doesn't fit that... Uh, that you know sound bite kind of thing well i i tell you what our my, my friend martin pop Popoff, he's been on our show oh yeah 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 but he's he's one of my favorite writers and if if you guys are into metal or hard rock and metal go check out his uh catalog of incredible books but he, he wanted very insistently or he wanted to do a book about kiss from 80 at the end of the elder to the end of Lick It Up. And that was the entirety of the book. Right. Love it. That's Love it. because that, I think you'd really, because let's face it, they were all going, holy shit, this might, this might be the end. Right. And, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, unfortunately he wasn't able to, 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 to be able, you know, that was something that we talked about and, yeah. and, and um, you know, how great if he could get, Honest discussions. Unfortunately, Eric Carr is no longer with us. But an honest discussion with Ace and, 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 and with a sane Vinny. And, and, you know, if Eric Carr, you know, was here and Gene and Paul. Bill and, of coin. Bill of Bill coin, coin would be, the, you know. Exactly. The powers that be right at the tail, right when they, like, he wanted to, like, start at the day the, they knew that the Elder was the biggest fucking bust they ever did. Yeah. Right. You start it that, that day and yeah. then end yeah. it right as they're starting to record Animalize. Just think of a detailed book of what that would be. Oh, um, that, to me, I think would be the most fascinating Kiss book ever because the mighty had fallen and yeah. they, had, yeah. they, had to re they had to start building up. And then it would end them going back up the ladder. But boy, yeah. what a story is there that is untold to this day Un you know there must have been like screaming fights you know sure. when, when something is so precious and you had it i mean you want it and now you're just going down rung by rung by rung it must have been uh i mean it would be a fantastic story again not even for kiss fans to read something akin to kiss and sell where anybody that's interested in the marketing of anything could read it and and have takeaways from it you know you bring up another good point about the writing in kiss i think it's going to go that way where people pick a thing in kiss to read and and write about it you know whether it's the you know what i'm doing or that time period there's so much in in kiss that's um between those milestones and those those albums that you can really go and just hone in on that and write something. I think you're going to see more of that as years go by. But of course, we're kind of against time, you know, with people being around and, and talking about that. But I'd love to see it all documented. Well, that I, was one of the things that Martin wanted, though. He wanted fresh interviews yeah. with Gene and Paul and, and, and Vinny, right. too. I mean, if you could get them to tell the truth about what it was like sneaking, really kind of sneaking his way into there and and, and 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 that's another thing too yeah. how much of history is accurate because let's face it paul says from the beginning he never wanted Vinny there and blah 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 but christ he wrote eight of the ten songs on lick it up he, he, he had to have won yeah. them around some degree there was at least a moment or a day or a week when he 
was totally content with Vinnie Vincent. In that yeah, band. you would think because of no you know, doubt, he, you know. Yeah, I mean, it, if you didn't want the guy around, wouldn't you have just said, "You're not writing on any of this record. We want right. you out. We're going to squeeze you out." It just the just the opposite happened. You know I, what I'm I mean? looking at Mike's. I know Mike has the Radio City poster back there, and that was my first Kiss concert, Kiss at Radio City. And I was just thinking about this the other day, how the Lick It Up tour in particular. Even it's even different than the Creatures tour. How ferocious the band was really on that tour. How I think it really pushed uh, Gene and Eric as a rhythm section to really. I think they really just uh, dug down and, and got even more raw live. Young and we, wasted live was great. Oh man! You know, I I I, th I think. In Gene's case, he probably had to because now he couldn't rely on a character in costume to entertain you. It was yeah. pretty much music now. The music really had to carry the band at that point in time. And, that, yeah. and, and that's not a problem for tours, Paul. I saw those tours. Both those tours were dying oh my. Yeah, no, I, oh, I, yeah. I, I loved them both. And, and what my biggest takeaway from Creatures to Look It Up was how comfortable Paul was out of makeup. It, Paul, really? Paul out of makeup was exactly like Paul in makeup. He just had no makeup on his face. He sure. he yeah. he fit perfectly. And then the other one, obviously, and we've talked about many times, is how Gene wasn't comfortable. Gene really needs that character to be him on stage. And when that was taken away... It was just like a naked Gene Simmons on stage, and he didn't know what to do. Gene created a major character, you know, and, and it's almost like, uh, you know, these guys who create one thing and are known for one thing. Uh, I don't know, like William Shatner being Captain Kirk, or it's so definitive, but Shatner's a bad example because he did reinvent himself. But it's just so darn good. The character it was so deep on so many levels. Um, that yeah, you know he's lightning struck and he did it. Now where do you go without that? Where do you? Nothing could really carry over. Whereas with Paul, it's just a whole dancing and prancing front man yep. type thing, you know. Uh, so Gene was kind of really left behind with that. Um, but I will say this, and and I don't know if you guys would agree with me. I think Mike, you would be more inclined to agree. But I think Gene did eventually get comfortable, if not visually. Um, without makeup during the the Animalized tour and Asylum tour, I think they really were this front line of you know these two whirling dervishes that would just take off on the stage. I and love that were, term. <laughs> yep, <laughs> whirling dervishes. That's awesome. <laughs> and and I think they really were. I mean, they were like the peak of their like aerobic powers. You know, these guys are just taking off on stage and entertaining. I remember seeing the Binghamton show, which I had mentioned to you guys. I saw one of the shows of Mark St. John, for example. And I remember, it, again, 14 years old, I was really close on Gene's side of the stage. And I was watching them in their stagecraft that whole night because they were definitely compensating for Mark St. John, who did a good show, but you could tell he was just uh, one step behind in the entire show. He was a little more conscious. Oh, I'm supposed to be here. Oh, okay, I'm supposed to move right. up front with them now. You could see that. But Gene and Paul really, it, it just marvel. It was a marvel to see how their stagecraft really, I think it evened out, you know, during Animal Eyes. Gene kind of found his footing again a little bit. Um, so that was good to see. But uh, during Lick It Up, sure, you know, he was still uh, he was still the demon, you know. He was yeah, like you, you, the, you, you, know? you can look at photos and video and go, wow, he's still... Yeah, mannerisms yeah. and everything are the demon with no costume and makeup. And you're right. I mean, by Animal Eyes and Asylum, that started to disappear. But I don't think he truly became comfortable on stage until Revenge. I, th I think Revenge yeah. is when he finally was like totally comfortable with his look, his clothing, everything. Because Animal Eyes and Asylum and Crazy Nights, you yeah. know, he was just... Yeah. All, all of that fashion worked fine on Paul because it's, it's Paul Stanley. He's he's fashionable. Gene, yeah. Gene, it didn't quite work. It just looked like a linebacker trying to Be put on for... some costumes, and it just didn't yeah. fit him naturally. Gene's not really, uh, I guess you could say, a looker, you know? Uh, 
and he's got like a build that really doesn't lend itself to being a rock star, you know. Do you remember? And, uh, you remember those? I, and I, I want to. Someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was the Crazy Nights tour where he wore those white, tall wrestling boots. Oh, Paul's uh, like space boots, like those well, moon boots. They they weren't moon boots. They were like wrestling shoes that Gene would wear, and they oh they, Gene, yes, yeah, uh, Gene, hot in they the shade. Were, hot, was it hot, in, hot shade? in the shade? He wore them. Yes, they were like really high, really high. They were what like, comes halfway what comes to the next knee after high tops. Yes, yeah. yes. And yes. I was just like, oh my god, Gene, that just doesn't look <laughs> right on you. It just doesn't. It doesn't work for you. You know, he and and that's why Revenge was so good because. He just needs black leather. He needs silver rings, chains. He needs just a black T-shirt. Paul can wear all the fashion and all the right, color right. he needs because it Mike, works. Mike. I, all right. I, let me just say something before my friends watch this and make fun of me. Because I do have a little bit of an issue with Gene's revenge look. And I'll tell you why. Boy, look at the time. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know why? I'll tell you why. Why should I tell you why? No, I I think it's a little bit of a put on as much as his asylum costume was. Um, the the pleather pants, the the clip on earrings. It, it, it uh, was it was definitely all a calculated wardrobe for sure. sure. But I think it was the first calculated wardrobe that was natural for Gene. All right, Gold's Gym shirts, really? Gene Simmons, Gold's Gym. Yeah, but he also wore. Didn't he wear like Psycho Bitch? <laughs> yes and comics and you know yeah. and the jeans addiction shirt and and listen uh, I, I gotta i gotta say when shirts. he when he had the goatee the goatee yeah. the goatee was just like first of all that's so out of place for kiss facial hair but that was also when we first had a blonde i i was dumbfounded when eric singer joined the band and i'm like he's blonde what the hell is that about they're not making him change his hair color yeah, visually it, it changed something, but his it, harmonica. It, it worked, solo. but it just. <laughs> <the> harmonica solo. <laughs> it, 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 oh, it Susanna! Just, I oh, think... Susanna! Really? I know. <laughs> now, yes, now, Mike, now, 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 fast forward to Carnival of Souls, and it's like, dude, you, you, you combat boots and cut off shirts, and you guys aren't that, you know. So there, there was another calculated wardrobe change that, visually, you could look at it and go, it's not. Fit. It doesn't fit. It doesn't work. You're a black leather band. I, I felt bad for Paul. I felt bad for Paul when he wore the leather overalls during uh, oh. like '94. <laughs> how? 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 What? What was Mark? Wasn't it like a drum poster where where yeah, Eric Eric's wear the overall sleeping. shorts? Oh, yes. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, like this what? long. The shorts are like this I, long. I, I've busted his balls about that before. You know. Yeah. I, I wonder, was there any green in those that wardrobe? Jeez, oh, well, <laughs> not yet. That's a little, not that's yet. a little, little joke there. It was only money that was in that wardrobe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cheap money. Um, but well, you, you know what? I I I love that that I love the Revenge album. I love the tour. I love the 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 bootleg videos that came out of that tour, especially the South American stuff. Yeah, yeah. South. I, American. I like Carnival of Souls a whole lot. I think Hate is one of the most evil Gene Simmons songs of all time. I fucking dig that tune. Look at the time. <laughs> yeah, really, Mike, really. All right, let Mike. me say this, though. I, I, I'm going to say so. I think you give me the European animalized lineup, and I think that smokes any revenge show out there. Bruce, do you agree with me? Oh, boy. <laughs> Look at the time. But, you know, I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> no? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not dissing on, on Eric Carr here, but Eric Singer just was, to me, a much better drummer, better fit, oh. ev better everything in the Kiss right, And now, the, guitar tones, the guitar tones on that tour, the European tour, are horrible. Oh, come on. Oh. Just Paul's BC Rich. Thin. Now we're two drummers now. Look, here's my in my drum kit is right here. Yeah, but here. you play guitar. I do, and I play bass. I know. I play, I've I do video. something. What is it? It's back there. But um, dude, Euro Animalize, ferocious, ferocious. Now I'll I'll, that, I'll, I'll that. give you one of my ultimate favorite Kiss bootlegs was on that tour. They Ipswich. only they only come out at night. 
trying to think of what show Sweden. that was. For. That was in Sweden. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, that, amazing that bootleg. Sh- the the live video from the Monsters of Rock where Doro introduces them has the worst Kiss guitar sound. Yes. Ever. Yes. That's brutal. Steinberger was a big problem with that. <laughs> yes. Yes. That was a big False piece guitar. of that. Horrible. Yeah. Yeah. You hear a lot of that, too. Even some of that you hear on the uh, WNEW FM broadcast from mm-hmm. the Ritz. You hear some of that. And her vocals are a little flat, too. But um, it was 110 degrees. I was at that show. It was literally that hot at that gig. I don't know how they perform there. I mean, that was like seeing Kiss in a Turkish bath. I mean, it was like the worst, worst thing, at, you know. <laughs> Does he like? He's, he he's loves Turkish, Turkish bath. baths. I am Tommy Summers. What's the matter? What? That's right. You're the California Tommy. But I like asylum. I mean, you can see by my outfit here. I, I kind of, you know, I don't. I'm not afraid of color, Mark. You I, know, and, I like and, as you can. Oh, forget it. <laughs> Mark's got red and black. That's color. Yes, that's right. That's right. But to me, you know, something like the asylum thing was very in line with the Kiss spirit of, of being over the top, you know, and, and just doing it. Did it work on everybody that you pulled through that funnel? No, I'm looking at you, Gene. But everybody else looked okay, oh, I thought, ag- ag- Yeah, again, Paul Paul was perfect. It, and, and you know what? It's almost like, you know, when we when we had um, the, the costume designer from that era on. Oh, and, yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah. It's almost like Paul just made sure she really focused on Paul's costume and Jean's was secondary. <laughs> it's like, make sure everything works for me. All right, just throw some sequins on Gene. Yeah. Not, don't worry about him. He doesn't really care about the band right now, so I'm not worried about what he's wearing right now, sort of sort of thing. But I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I loved all of the color from, from the Asylum era. You know, the, it, it was over the top. It was Kiss. It was Paul Stanley. Yeah, Gene, you know, Gene looked like Maud. You know, and, and that's the only thing, and not to hammer away at this revenge thing there, Mark, but, you know, the, the idea that all of a sudden that kiss is really tough and they curse a lot more now. I guess I was a little older, and I remember with my friends, even in a neighborhood, we were kind of like, ah, eh, it didn't, it rang very hollow with us. Maybe, again, more in a way than them prancing around in the outfits from Crazy Nights or something, you know? To be fair, Paul didn't start cursing till Creatures of the Night. Do you want to, there, do you care what the preachers more. say about us or your parents? Fuck them. And that con- that continued on all yes. through the 80s. So that, the revenge year was way predated. All right, but wait a minute. They weren't wearing curses on their shirts during those eras, though. I'll give you that, but right? Paul's, I mean, all stage... I tell you what, you really want to uh, do a really character sort of uh, analysis. Yeah. Go from the Sydney 80s show right to, you know, the, the the creatures where Paul does the whole, you care what your parents, you hear what the preachers. You I, I would say extend that, go go to an animalized tour where he just, you know, his his Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson rat, doll. Yeah. Yeah, you know, his... His um, love gun introductions, which were... But that started at the Creatures Tour as well. But I, I felt like it really got drawn out and spotlighted into the 80s. No, I, I agree with you there. Yeah. Well, but I, I, I was always kind of uncomfortable with with all that because it they didn't need to do that on the love gun tour. You know what I mean? I just realized I wasn't on the screen. Um yeah, you know something? I, I liked the structure. I thought the structure of the Animalized Tour and, and Asylum was really cool. I know it was a brief show, and you got, like, one song, three songs, and then you got a solo spot. And then you got another three songs and a solo spot. I thought it was well-constructed. And, and at the time, I was able to deduce that Paul was like the poor man's David Lee Roth, you know? Before the Creatures Tour, he must have saw the Diver Down Tour or something. And, you know, Dave was going into that storytelling realm and I think Paul sat down and said, OK, I'm going to tell a story about Love Gun. I'm going to do all that. And that became, to me, as a big Paul Stanley fan, I loved all that stuff. Um, and the Michael Jackson routine and putting down Duran Duran and uh, the Thompson Twins, you know. I remember the first time I heard the curses, I was actually kind of blown away, guys, when I heard the Universal Amphitheater boot from the Creatures Tour. Mm-hmm. Great and show. I think that, 
Yeah, it is. And I think there's some cursing on there. I think they were uh, – also, they had Motley nipping at their heels, right, at well, that time? I, I, I think that's part of what was pushing that that change in language – from creatures, especially into the '80s, was all of a sudden now you got these bands out of L.A. Yeah. that are just yeah. full on nasty at times, and right. we got to compete with them. Yeah, yeah, I, I think Paul, especially, uh, you know, was always taking the temperature of the market, you know, and what was working and everything. And I think, uh, and as C.K. Lent said, you know, will this work for Kiss? You know, let's just kind of juxtapose this onto the Kiss idea now. And uh, I, I think that really did happen. I, I don't know, though. I, I, think, um, I think for Paul, it kind of worked. I, I think Paul had a good shot at being a little more popular than he was in the 80s. I, I think Kiss always had that bias against them with the airplay and everything. And I think things like Heavens on Fire should have been bigger. And Paul could have been um, a little more popular, again, along the lines of a David Lee Roth or something. I, I, I think that's what he was clearly going for. But I think with the biases... Is that a word? Against it is now. Yeah, it is now. And uh, analysis. I think, you know, that's right. <laughs> hey, listen, I know enough about the German language to know what I'm talking about. But um, yeah, I think so. What was I saying? Well, you know, and I, I, I think you're right. But I think for Paul to become what you were talking about, he had to go solo because yes. he was yes. still. Through the 80s, he was still holding true to Kiss, and Kiss was him and Gene for the most part, and they had to share the spotlight and the successes and everything else. So it, it would have been very easy for Paul, you know, coming asylum to go, well, you know what, I'm going to do a solo career at the same it, time, and I'm going to go. Right. Because, you know, when, especially Mark, I mean, I don't know, did you see Paul's solo tour in the 80s, Ron? Yes. Yes. So I mean, there, there, there was Paul Stanley being the true, unbridled ringmaster on stage at that show. It was just freaking amazing to watch him. He yeah, those shows were great. He didn't, you know, he had a great band, but he wasn't there to spotlight the band. This was the Paul Stanley yeah. band. This wasn't Kiss. You felt that tour was interesting because you felt the, his enthusiasm. Yes. It was insane. I saw uh, the Lamore show. I saw the Lamore show. And again, New York, you know, you felt his enthusiasm. He felt. You could tell it, it was a really cool um, thing to see in, in history to see that. I think he should have done a solo record and then gone back to Kiss. It would have been something like uh you know, Lou Graham having a top 20 hit, you know, with Midnight Blue or Dennis D. Young. You know, those were the better examples uh, of, of people that stepped out, did something, had a little hit, a slightly different sound, but still in the wheelhouse. I think Paul could have done that. But I don't you, think anybody would, you know, you know, get him the shot. But it, it, we always sort of say, though, that most of the 80s were basically just Paul Stanley solo albums with the Kiss name on it. All right. But is that part of the revisionist thing? I mean, it's kind of obvious. I'm well, just saying. Now, for the sake look, of looking back now, you can see it. At the time, it was Kiss because we didn't know the internal turmoil that was going on. Right. But you know, is is Crazy Nights something Gene wants to do? Is that the Kiss direction he wanted to do, or is that what yeah. Paul wanted to do? And because Gene wasn't there, nobody was able to tell Paul differently. It's sort of like. Um, Twisted Sisters. Um, Come out and play. No, not what's well, the next one after, one after that? Love, Love is for suckers. Love is for suckers. Great record. Which Great record. is oh my a god. Is, look at you know, the time. That's a decent. Like Come out and play. That's a D. Snyder that, solo track, album. Great. Fire Final still track, burns great. is awesome. Fire still burns is AJ Perro's masterpiece. Oh, that is that is that you're that you're right. Yep. Well, yeah, yeah, good song. But good but, song. but you know, Love yeah, is for yeah, Love yeah, is for yeah, Suckers yeah, is awesome. a D. Snyder solo yeah. album that just had the Twisted Sister logo put on it. For yeah. the most part, I I could I could feel that Crazy Nights is is a Paul Stanley solo album that's got the Kiss logo on it. Seven yeah. Star by Sabbath is the same way that they made them put the Black Sabbath title on it. Right. That know. was supposed to be an Iomi kind of solo right. thing, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, do it. 
You know, getting, no, get, get, getting back to the discussion earlier about interviewing Gene and Paul, if you had yeah. a chance to interview Paul, it would be great to do a very, very narrow focused discussion of. So wouldn't it be great to do an interview with Paul Stanley where you could narrow the focus of the topic down to that idea of a solo album, a solo career, 1987, was it? something that was available to you did the label make that available to you were there discussions with management on how to go solo and maintain kiss that's something we've never really heard discussed or revealed we know that that at during the 80s gene and paul in their record contracts had solo albums but how serious was it that you know, and there's a lot of feeling that Paul did his solo tour as some way to show he could do it if he wanted to. He could go out and be a solo artist if he wanted to. Hey, Gene, you better get back or I'm going off on my own. I'd love to have just that micro discussion with Paul about that. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I think that'd be great. And and I think you did get solo, Paul, of course, you know, with, with uh, the Smashes tracks and the videos being focused on him. I mean, Gene is literally asleep in the uh, Let's Put the X and Sex video. If you, He's barely awake. They must have filmed that at like six in the morning because he is like sleeping. If you look at the video, it's hilarious. Well, he you know, and, know and Paul, you know? Paul has no guitar. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that that was a moment where I'm looking at that going, wow, Paul is yeah. truly just a front man here. He's not a guitar player in this How video. How timely is this? Liz saw that video for the first time yesterday. Wow. Really? And she said to me, what the fuck is this? <laughs> she goes, do you know a song called Rock Hard? I said, the Kiss song? She goes, yeah. She goes, when did that come out? And I said, well, that's, you know, I gave her the spiel. She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the worst. I, she goes, I, I couldn't even get through the end. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. How How is that kiss? This that, is that, fucking That was Paul's. Horrible. That was again well, here's the, Paul Stanley solo with a band behind him. But, well, but here's. We had, an, we had you know, something interesting too earlier yeah. this week. My wife and I went on, on, on a little bit of a drive and I. And I I made a mix. It's funny, you're talking about my iPod earlier. I made a mix of all like funk and dance stuff, but I mixed it up. I threw in like the Rod Stewart dance stuff, the Stones dance stuff. You know the song "Dance" by Alice Cooper off of off of "Go to Hell." I put love that, that song. Okay. Anyway, love so I, that I, I threw song. those kind of songs in there along with yeah. funkadelic and you know stuff like that, '70s nice. dance music, and and I threw in "Dirty Living." And I didn't tell her it was. I just I'm, and she's like, "That's oh, really good." And I'm Slipped like, it in there. You know yeah. what that is? <laughs> no. That's Kiss. No, I think, yeah, it is. You know, so I, you know, but you go from one extreme to that rock hard. That's just that's a horrible song. That is, well, yeah, that's just not even. I I don't even think it was releasable. I mean, I I really, yeah, I mean, I could talk. I'm not in Kiss, but I I don't. I just think that was very subpar for the time. And you know, the thing is too, if you're going to go out in front of a band and dance, you should know how to dance. Well, you know, Paul Paul has said that in his book too. That certainly wasn't his most proud moment. He knew they were rudderless, <laughs> right. and you know what I mean. Um, it is he, what he was, it is. He was doing the best he could, he could. to keep this machine yeah, alive. But yes. y yeah, you you were you were looking at this as a fan, going, "This is different, odd, strange, sucks, <laughs> uncomfortable." I odd mean, what well, sucks. You, you know, yes. Paul is wearing. Outfits that look like they're S and M pants. You know what was it? The high chainmail and the, the yeah, chainmail. I'm like, isn't that Cher's top? Doesn't Cher wear that top? <laughs> I like it that in, in Rock Hard when he's against like, for some reason he's against like a cloud, like a sky background. But he's doing the moves like he's literally watching somebody off camera do the moves for him because he does like all the classic '80s when he's doing each finger and then he does the tell time thing like that you know a, a lot of i never videos. i never watched it that much to know i mean like <laughs> I, I think I, I saw that like once or something I'm like i'm never watching this again this is your homework you gotta watch no. it this, uh, that, those totally are those times when i i don't know how i stayed a fan but i did 
I, I was like, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. Dude, those were dark days. People don't realize that now, but they, those were dark days, man. You know, there were some times you really had to hang in there. Uh, and yet I know we all di like different albums, but I was just talking to my buddies about this. We're like, remember we had to pretend we loved Hot in the Shade? You know, to Pete, to outsiders. Yes. You know, among us, we would say we didn't like it. But on the outside, we said, no, it's a great record. But, you know, those albums, um, you know, of course, the, the, the production, the demos and all that. But they're very um, they suffer from multiple personality disorder. They're very fractured in terms of, again, Paul, what he was doing. And Gene was writing like these coming of age uh, wisdom type songs. Betrayed. You know? But then he yeah. had like Cadillac Dreams. And that's a song that gets I like that song. It's bouncy. It's fun. Betray I, like I love Betrayed. I love Betrayed. I, I like and that, too. I like when Gene writes about taxes. He writes about taxes and Betrayed, <laughs> and I think um, Thou Shall Not, right? Doesn't he revisit no, the I, idea of tax? I, I love all things revenge. I, he I, hates I, religious I, figures. He goes after them a lot. Um, but And then Paul's writing King of Hearts or Silver Spoon, <laughs> which Silver Spoon is like All-American Man Part 2. <laughs> and, you know, I, I mean, maybe I do like Hot in the Shade. <laughs> I don't know, but, you know, they bury Eric's song all the way on the end of the record, all the way on the end of the record, and then after that you're rewarded. Is it after Boomerang or is Boomerang the last song? I think Boomerang's the last song. I'm pretty Boomerang sure. is an ugly song. That's just an, that's, when people talk about songwriting, it's just an ugly, it's, it doesn't sound right chord-wise, it's just an ugly song. Turn it's up the, the purse, perfect, Bruce. Hot in the Shade is a perfect example of why a band needs a producer. Yes. yes, absolutely. This You're is so what can happen if you produce your own music. Like they're putting this out against Pump and Doctor Feelgood. They're putting <laughs> I, this I into into a healthy hard rock ma uh, marketplace. They're putting that record out. Somebody at Polygram should have stopped them. I, I mean, maybe even the record label. It but edited I a couple songs off that. It's too long because the quality's not there. Right. You know. Well, guy, guy, guys, we got to wrap. So run. Uh, one last plug for the book. Do you want to send people talk anywhere? About it? <laughs> when are we going to start talking about the book? <laughs> uh, if you're scrubbing along on YouTube, go to six minutes and 42 seconds. I mentioned the book there. No, but here's, <laughs> here's the deal. Conversations with Phantoms. It's, it's coming along nicely. Um, as an update, all the interviews are edited. Um, I'm planning on wrapping up the whole thing. I got a kind of a cool cover idea. Um, that's being designed by my friend Mike Casal. More about him in a second, because I want to tell you guys something else. Um, and um, I'm trying to wrap up all the writing and get this out in the first quarter of next year. That's the hope. Uh, it's going to be on Bear Manor Media, bearmanormedia.com. Uh, the, the Facebook page is up and running, Conversations with Phantoms. Uh, I've been much more active on there now that I've got my arms around this thing. And I'm, I'm really getting to the point where uh, in the project where I can really begin to have some fun with it and get into it. And that's why I got into it. So I'm really excited about it. Uh, we have the exclusive audio trailer uh, that we're, we're going to put right here. Ladies and gentlemen, Conversations with Phantoms, interviews about the 1978 TV movie Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park. I'm talking to Calvin Richards. Was that my name? You, Chopper, and Slime, uh, of course, were uh, the lowriders. Right. Vicious thugs um, <laughs> out for a bad time in the park. Indeed. Written by KISS fan Ron Albanese, it's just as fun as the movie starring Gene, Ace, Peter, and Paul. It's more than that, isn't it? Yes, Conversations with Phantoms also goes behind the scenes. Look, let me tell you the truth about the, the movie. How dirty is this? I came in and I gave it the script and the deal was made and then we were off and running. They were trying to shock us. Gene and Paul were the real personalities. These four idiots clumping through our back lots on high heel shoes. <laughs> Pretty terrible. Severe headaches. We saved them thousands of dollars. Unreal. Disney would never do anything, you know, like that. Conversations with Phantoms also covers the aftermath of Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park. Were you happy when you saw the final product? I was happy that the thing got made. Particularly, I wasn't happy with the direction. And neither one of them were great writers. Kiss is a unit. Mm -hmm. yeah, don't separate them. But don't try to break up this unit. We did it to, to make them look good. Pretty mystical. The book includes 14 interviews, plus phantom findings, ruminations about the greatest television movie ever.
uh, you and your, your, your bad uh, partners there uh, kick down a wall of people. Uh -huh. and, and you taunt them by screaming. And the walls come tumbling down. I liked when you fired Abner Devereaux. You said, you've been working too hard, Ab. You need to relax for a change. Travel. See the world. Get the fuck out. It's the book you've waited 40 years to read about Kiss's NBC TV movie produced by Hanna-Barbera. It actually over a period of time did well. I mean, everyone actually made out pretty well with that movie. I remember thinking, God, you know, it's so cool. I thought it was a nice piece. It was a hoot. Oh, yeah, it was fun. Conversations with Phantoms, exclusive interviews about the 1978 TV movie, Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park, written by Ron Albanese, coming soon from Bear Manor Media. It's ironic, isn't it, Ron? I think it's a great idea. Here. Um... And also, I mentioned my friend Mike Casal, and, and this is something else I just wanted to mention. Uh, you could edit this out if you want, Mike, but we are uh, going to be doing a pod about Cheap Trick. And in the 90s, long story short, we did uh, a Cheap Trick fanzine called One on Four. It got pretty popular. We had paid... Loved it. Uh, to them um we, we struck up like a, a cool uh friendship and and working relationship that in many ways continues to uh, today mike uh designs their holiday cards i've done some liner notes th for cheap trick through the years and what we're doing is we're digitizing all them uh every issue there's about eight of them and we're going to be posting them and as we do them we'll do a podcast about each one and give some background oh, information that's a fun, that's a fun way to that. go back and use a fanzine yeah, yeah, I, I'm excited about it, you know, because uh, people did like it, and the fact that the band dug it was a big thing, and it's an interesting time in Cheap Trick's history as well, you know, it was just as the internet was taking off, um, and this was the main outlet, as they were trying to, they, as they did their revenge, you know, the, the, the self-titled right album, you know? Right, that is I, arguably their best album. And I've been a fan since the <laughs> Heaven Tonight, <laughs> Dream Police, <clears throat> in color. Red, one on one. One on one, is as one, good on as one. Stuff. yes. Great. One, one, look, we're all big, huge. I love Cheap Trick. Oh, man. Um, I tell you what, the Red Ant album is, I love every song on it. You know, you, oh, did that, you know last week they busted out a song uh, uh, from that at some gig last week? You, they used to do like uh, Wrong All Along a lot. Eight Miles yeah. Low is like one of the greatest Cheap, song, cheap Trick songs ever. Love that song. They did, uh, yeah, yeah. Really, I like that one too. That's actually, you know what? I like that song, but it's probably my least favorite on the record. But it's good. That's how strong that album is. My least favorite song is really good. Does that record also have like fifteen tracks, like Hot in the Shade? But it's yeah, but it's got fifteen really good tracks. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. hot in the shade. There's no read my body on there. Oh. <laughs> Say something, everybody, audience of three sides. The riffage underneath everything in read my body is really cool. There's a lot going on there on guitar. I, I don't think yeah. I've ever listened to Hot in the Shade that deeply to pay He's attention. Saying, it's He's doing the moves from rock hard. That's what that's what Mark's doing. <laughs> Let's just say I'm not rock hard talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So, 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 so let's let's <coughs> let's come up with some homework questions here. Um, what when is, when is Ron going to talk about his book? Yeah, <laughs> homework question number one. Do you remember the title of Ron's book? And what what homework question number two related to Phantom? What did you think of it? Did you, for, for from two angles, if you were a kid back then and watched it when it debuted, what did you think of it? Or if you came later in history and watched it somewhere on VHS or DVD or something like that, what did you think of Phantom? Right, right, and and it was interesting to get Mark's view actually because uh, I was eight years old. So for me, I was just galvanized watching the screen. And one thing I did, I'll never forget this. It's like the movie possessed me or something. After the movie was over, I watched it on our Magnavox console TV. And when it goes, when it went right to that freeze frame of Gene going into God of Thunder at the end, I got up and in my mother's burnt sienna shag rug, you know, when you could like move your hand and make things in the rug, I made a huge kiss logo. I was like, yeah. <laughs> And then the next day she vacuumed. But, <laughs> but yeah, I, you know what I mean? Like it, it just, I was like totally cool with it. I wasn't, you know, saying, hey, this plot is a little weird or it drags forever. 
Do I have to see the Canyon marching band again? You know, um, it, it worked for me, you know, but I was defending myself with, you know, putting my life on the line the next year for I was made, you know, which was, which is interesting. You know, we were fighting in the streets over that one, man. That was like, forget it. Kiss is this. They sold out. Uh, they're like the village people now, you know, um, the cars rule, you know, things like that. I love the cars. And I, I stopped <laughs> talking. I do, too. I stopped talking about my book. You see that? Thought, I actually see? did that. He did it. Not us. Not he us. Did. Not us. All right. So there's a bunch of homework for you. You can also chime in on um, how much you love or hate um, the Paul Stanley smashes, thrashes, and hits era. Love, love, to pick, love to hear some comments on that one. X and Sex, major rewrite of Addicted to Love by Robert Palmer. It's um, almost a blatant rewrite. Head over to Facebook.com slash Three Sides <laughs> of the Coin. <laughs> three Sides of the Coin dot com. Instagram, our Facebook groups, everywhere where you are, found online. Please. Leave us things. a comment. Um, and that's it. We're out of here, guys. Till next week. Oot! So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks. Download your free, free copy of the KISS School of Marketing. 11 Lessons I Learned Working with KISS. The number one downloaded business book on Noise Trade. Go to books.noisetrade.com slash Michael Brandvold. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. So you love the show. Go to iTunes.ThreeSidesOfTheCoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.